Is there any additions or? Uh, adi or uh, I have none for closed session. Yeah. None. None. Okay. And there's no public comment. So let's go. I, I got. I got mine. Okay. Although it might be a little bit. Okay. Shall we go in the other room? Yes, please. Bye -bye. To stop providing any and all. Further defense of former director Terry of Vieira in, in connection with the case of Holloway versus SLVWD, Vieira, and others. The board finds that an actual and specific conflict of interest has arisen because plaintiff Holloway recently filed a motion for summary judgment seeking over $800,000 for the district at Mr. Vieira's expense. I want to welcome you all to the meeting. Really happy to see so many of you. And we're going to make a change in the agenda. You want to say what that is, Rick? Yeah, well, we will do that uh, at the addition for deletions. Of the okay. Panel. So let's have roll call. Director Hulls? Here. Director Swan? Here. <coughs> Director Bruce? Here. <coughs> President Henry? Here. Director Smallman? Here. Okay, so any additions or deletions or kind of change in the open session agenda? Yes, uh, Chair Henry, I request that we move item 11D, the Santa Margarita Groundwater Agency's Joint Power Authority Guiding Principles and Supreme Agency Roles and Responsibilities presentation by Dave Seppos at the beginning of the meeting. Mr. Seckles has a long drive home. Uh, it would be good if you could get through this presentation. He has approximately a one hour presentation for the board. Okay. All right. Uh, uh, taking no objections to that, Mr. Seckles, please. Uh, may I introduce Mr. Seckles? Yes, you may. Um, I'd just like to quickly give a little background about um, Dave Seckles. He is currently the um, Facilitator for the Santa Margarita Groundwater Agency. His background is um, he has 30 years of mediating water supply and groundwater sustainable um, efforts across the state. He's currently working with eight different sustainability agencies across <coughs> the state, and um, and he was integral in the in the development of the new Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, which passed in the state of California recently. And so with that. One more. Yes. Uh, is he being moved to above oral communication? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Just want to make that clear. Thank you. Uh, good evening to everybody. Um, I'll try to just get myself set here. We're generally See, your attention should better be on the screen, certainly better than me anyway. Uh, I want to say hi to those of you that were able to make the, uh, the workshop on Saturday. I see a couple of uh, familiar faces. I'm sorry I didn't get all y'all's names. Um, I'm from the South originally, so I say y'all a lot. But, uh, so uh, <coughs> it'll come out. Um, so if Jan, if you can, uh, the, I'll do the PowerPoint first. So the, so, um, this is uh, a presentation. Oh, I'm sorry, Louis, you get the worst seat in the house. Don't you? Um, so, this is a, a presentation that I've done in a, oh, by the way, for the camera, do you want me to like stay fairly well put, like not move around a lot? <laughs> You're fine. I'm okay. Um, I want to make sure that Lois has got space. Okay. Um, so this is a presentation that I've done a little bit of modification for y'all here tonight, but um, I've done this in a number of basins, as, as Jen indicated. Um, 
I'm currently working with eight different groundwater basins around the state of California. I've worked with or overseen my staff working on um, 35 different GSAs and basins around the state. So quite literally from San Diego County to Siskiyou County, from Owens Valley to the coast. So we've been pretty geographically spread. We've been working with a lot of different basins, different scales. And this is a, a version of a presentation that I've given in a number of places. And it, and it seems to have been um, very well received and pretty informative because um, what it goes through is really laying out what these agencies, these new groundwater agencies, are vested with. And one of the sort of underlying things that I want to really stress from the get-go is that with the advent of the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, or SIGMA as we call it, um, the, the best analogy I can give, and I'll talk to this in a little bit, is that it's as if on a certain date, which was June 30, 2017, it's as if hundreds, literally hundreds of brand new cities formed around the state. And the reason I say that is because the powers that are vested to these agencies statutorily, and I'll get into what they, what those powers are in a little bit, are sweeping and they're broad. And these are regulating agencies. These aren't organizations, they're not committees, they're not commissions, they're not clubs, they're nothing. These are regulating agencies formed by statute to regulate groundwater throughout the state of California. There are 127 basins out of five, so the state of California is 515 groundwater basins. 127 of them were deemed as required to comply with SIGMA. Within those basins, at least one GSA or groundwater sustainability agency was going to form in each, in many cases more than one formed. So there are literally hundreds of these brand new agencies that are going to the exact same activities that the Santa Margarita Groundwater Agency is going through, and many, many, many of them are joint powers authorities like that with incumbent partnerships and memberships such as this water district, so you're not alone. And this is to sort of guide you through or let you sort of get a sense of what these roles are. So if you can change, next slide. So I'm going to go through some general introduction. I'm going to talk about some definitions, do a little bit of background on the presentation, where the information comes from, and then really dive into the roles and responsibilities. And then after this, I'm going to transition into the work that I've been doing with the Santa Margarita Groundwater Agency in there and helping them to develop what they call the guiding principles, which they've recently uh, adopted in December. So next slide, please. So um, this may be sort of old school for some of y'all, but for not, I'm just going to just give some, give some of the high points. So this is statutory. This is where the statute comes from. Okay, the, ground, the Sustainable Groundwater Ag Management Act Sigma said that any local agency or combination of agencies overlying a groundwater basin may decide to become a, a GSA, Groundwater Sustainable Energy, <coughs> for that basin. A local agency meant it could be a local public agency that had water supply and or water management and or land use responsibilities. So that meant that water districts clearly, it meant that counties, because counties have land use authorities, it meant that cities, because cities have land use authorities. Most counties don't have water purveyor responsibilities, some do, but by and large most counties don't, but a lot of cities do, and they are also, or they also work in partnership. Now the little asterisk down there is just so, you know, counties, cities, water agencies, we didn't beyond that. There are community service districts, or PUDs, planned unit, planned, um, unit developments. If they've got water management or water supply or something in their mission, they were allowed to become a, a local agency, a, a SIGMA agency, a GSA. Um, rec um, RCDs, re re uh, resource conservation districts, were allowed to become uh, GSA if they wanted to be. Next slide. So a couple of things. One or more GSA had to be formed per basin or sub-basin, and there, those, both those terms were used because in some places, particularly over in the Central Valley, where you have very, very large, what are called alluvial conditions, which is you know, where, the, where the alluvial deposits have been, and you've got these really sort of interspaced groundwater um, aquifer and aquifer conditions, They're, those were too large to manage, I and mean, you couldn't have legitimately or, or feasibly managed an entire Sacramento Basin single agency or a San Joaquin. So they broke them up into sub basins <coughs> in some places. Uh, that's not the case here, but it is in some. Um, a GSA had to be formed by a single eligible agency or by legal agreement between two or more eligible agencies. And it had to be a legal agreement, not just like a handshake, not a yeah, we think it's okay, not a memo. It had to be a memorandum of agreement. It had to be some form of legal agreement. Uh, and then in places like here, for instance, where you have a water district that represents a certain pop, certain segment of populace, but then you have the county. So I see John Ricker is here. So you've got county unincorporated areas. We call those under Sigma the white spaces. And so 
within any particular basin or in most basins, you had different combinations of agencies, a water district, an irrigation district, a CSD, a city, but then you still had other land that wasn't managed by anybody. There was a lot of private pumpers, people had individual wells. All of those lands fell under the auspices of a county unless the county voided its responsibility and basically said we, we will not it was called a negative declaration, and they would have to negatively declare that they would not manage that groundwater, and then somebody else would have to step in and do it. That's not the case here, but I'm just sort of giving you background. That's how counties are practically involved. Next slide, please. So some milestones and implications. Two or more GSAs must prepare a coordination agreement, a legal agreement between them. So in places where, and that's not applicable here because there, a partnership is formed, or a joint powers authority, formed here in this basin under Public Code 6500, which is the, exercise, the Joint Exercise of Powers Act. That's what it's called, and that's what JPAs are formed under. And so that's what you have here. Had you not, and had you opted to have been an independent agency, a couple of variables that would have come into play is that two agencies would have to form a legal coordination agreement describing exactly how they were going to work together, and they would be expected to work together. The statute actually says so. The GSAs all had to be formed, as I said earlier, by June 30, 2017. Groundwater sustainability plans, which is the big thing that these agencies are all doing, have to be, in this case, pre prepared by January 31, 2022. If this were a critically overdrafted basin, like several basins in the, Sac in the Central Valley are, they have to be done by 2020. So they have a two-year um, expedited timeline, and that's really tough, because those are some of the most critically hit basins. Relative to here, the, or relative to there, you guys are, are actually in really, really good shape. The, some of those places really, really have tough situations. Um, getting back to the coordination agreement for a minute and the, and the GSPs, a couple of other things that are regulatory required, and, and just so you know, should you want to do a little light reading about Sigma, there's the statute itself, which is pretty lengthy, and then there's the regulations. There was emergency regs. So the statute was written, and then there was a whole year that went by. I actually worked on the development of those regs as well. And then the regs really are like 48 or 50 pages, and those sort of spell <coughs> out what each agency has to do and how the GSPs, ground sustainability plans, are going to be done. A couple of key variables that you need to know, again, just for background, it's not applicable here because you have a single agency. Um, in places where that's not the case, um, it is a mandate that all agencies, all GSAs, ground sustainability agencies, have to use single data sets. So there are places in the state where agencies, four or five or six agencies, just couldn't reconcile their differences between each other, and they all wanted to go it alone. And they all <coughs> had their own independent consultants who worked for them. Uh -uh. They all have to find a way to consolidate and bring all their data together. They literally have to work on the single data sets. If they were to submit GSPs to the state of California and they were using different sets of, of data, the state will reject it. Um, they have to create these coordination agreements that show exactly how they're going to work together. Now, that doesn't mean how they're going to share resources together, water resources together in the future, just how they're going to integrate and problem solve together. Because the fear was if you have multiple agencies, and one says, we're going to do this, and the other guy's like, well, if you do that, that's creating a direct effect on us, and we're going to do this, and it's a direct effect on them. The state of California said, go settle it out, and if you don't, you're immediately non-compliant now, and you'll be non-compliant when the GSP deadline is. And here's a key distinction. When you're non-compliant, and there's a couple places in the state where, for instance, GSAs have opted to pull out. They went into partnership, and then they pulled out. The second a GSA or the second an agency does that, they immediately become non-compliant and have to form their own GSA. That's a multi-month process that has to happen because you've got to go through certain public public. Uh, yeah. Is any of this applying to? Um, I'm just giving some background because some people have said that there's been some discussion here within this space about why there was a partnership versus individual. But, but none so, of it applies to us. What you're it's, no, no. So it's just bottom line then. So costs. Um, the cost to run a GSA is roughly usually 250 to 300k annually, or maybe even 250 to 500. The cost of the GSP is anywhere from a half a million to a million in cost. Next slide. Um, Sigma was amended in after one year's time because what happened was water corporations like mutuals and public and private water corporations said, hey, we procure water, we, we extract water, how come we're not allowed to be involved? So they modified it to allow them to, to these types of agencies to also be involved. But they had to be invited to, par to participate by a GSA. So the test was no private water corporation was allowed to be an agency on their own. They had to be invited <laughs> in to be a part of a partnership. Next slide. Private pumpers 
sadly, I, I, I'm going to be very candid there, sadly private pumpers were really not talked about much in Sigma. Okay, the only two references that are that even sort of head fake towards private pumpers in, in Sigma in the statute is consideration of interest of all beneficial users, which I'll get into more in a second, and then this second one about in addition to the authorities having to do with, with agreements of private parties. Um, so that meant that private pumpers, individual well owners, kind of got the short end of the stick under Sigma. And that's, I'm just being blunt and candid. In this basin, I applaud this basin that they put private pumpers on their, on their agency board. So, so there are private pumpers that, that are on the, the Santa Margarita Groundwater Agency. The statute did allow for what's called de minimis. Any person who extracts for domestic purposes two acre feet or less per year falls under what's called a de minimis category, and that provides some protections and some limitations of what an agency can impose upon de minimis users if they, if they fall into that category. Next slide. So some background. Some background of where the guiding principles and also some of this next work comes in is that just, you know, I, I interviewed and have been continuing to interview various staff and, and uh, board members from the various agencies here in this basin, um, and these are just some of the documents that I've used to prepare the rest of this presentation. Next one, please. So under Sigma, and actually we're going to talk about this at the next workshop in February, but very quickly, six, Sigma has six potential undesirable results, and you can be found to be unsustainable on one or more of these six conditions. If you've got impacted groundwater elevation, um, I'm going to actually jump down to subsidence because subsidence is unrelated. Next one, if you've got subsidence, which you don't have here, but just, just so you know, if the land is really sunk, that actually changes the, the size of the, the, the aquifer itself and it impacts the storage capacity. Be like, like, if you hit a big gas tank really hard with a hammer, you would change the shape of that in the capacity. That's basically what happens geologically. Um, that's groundwater storage. Seawater intrusion, that's not an element here. Degraded water quality might be an, an, issue, an issue in this basin. Um, land subsidence is not, and groundwater surface water interconnection, that very likely will be a variable that you'll be dealing with here, the relationship between the different aquifers in the San Lorenzo and some of the trips. Sigma provided significant amounts of local control, more than any other piece of policy that I've ever seen. It has what I call few shalls and many ways. Thou shalt create a GSA, the agency, thou shalt create a GSP, the plan, thou shalt do public engagement. Everything else that I'm going to talk about here, not, not all of it, but a large part of it come, falls into the, an agency can do these or not do these things. So that's the shalls versus the mays. And these are these authorities that I talked about earlier that have been granted to agencies if they want to take them on. Next slide. So GSA roles and responsibilities, in my professional opinion, sort of fall into these general categories. Of governance, outreach and engagement, compliance, funding, and a whole set of general authorities coordination and technical. So I'm, the rest of this is going to be sort of going through in greater detail um, bullet points extracted straight from the regs and from the statute. Okay, go ahead please. So under governance, you have to create an agency. You have to establish membership. Um, you have to determine just all these things that you would do. How long is a member going to be in there? You have to develop a decision making process and a dispute resolution process. That's a really key thing there because under the regulations, under public engagement, if any of you have ever been involved as members of the public or agency members about on CEQA, California Environmental Quality Act or NEPA, National Environmental Policy Act, this is a much higher bar for public engagement than you've ever seen in CEQA and NEPA. Okay, CEQA and NEPA are public disclosure laws and their responsibilities are do public <coughs> meetings under certain conditions, do public notifications, things like that. Under SIGMA, SIGMA has some really specific requirements that I, I think I have some slides that I'll get into, but if not, it things like you have to describe in your SIGMA document who the interested parties are, you've got to describe how decisions were made, you've got to describe how the public input was used to make decisions. Um, it's a much higher bar in terms of public engagement. Um, next slide. So as I talked about, the, this, this the agency was created in June 2017. JPAs, this is an interesting sort of thing to get your head around. Joint Powers Authorities are created as unique governing entities okay, to solve or address a problem. Now, yes, they are representative of a partnership of multiple agencies, but by definition and by statute, the responsibility of a JPA is to address the issue at hand, okay? So there's representation from member organizations. There has to be a commitment to the roles, purpose, and responsibilities of a new agency. So this agency, as a member of this JPA, this GSA, the, you know, the groundwater agency, your members who sit there, Lois, whomever, when they sit in the JPA room, their job is to help to deliver the outcomes of that JPA. Yes, it is to keep in mind the constituents, but at the end of the day, that JPA's job is 
achieve and maintain groundwater sustainability in this basin. That's their foremost job. Um, JPAs, there's an acceptance of mutual liability and sharing of mutual liability and risk, which is sometimes helpful and protective because somewhere in the state of California, once GSPs are done, agencies are going to get sued. It's, it's going to happen because some people are going to be haves and some people are going to have nots when the, J, when the GSAs are, or the GSPs are done. Um, and then, as like I said, balancing the needs and requirements of the member organization and the new agency. Next slide. So I made reference to this earlier. So under statute, there's what are called beneficial users and beneficial uses. That's 11 classes. So what you see there, all of these parties and all these entities are all beneficial users. Okay, so when we talk about environmental uses and users, you know, the, the environmental quality unto itself is, an, is a beneficial use that an agency has to be pre prepared to deal with and, and protect. Surface water users, tribes, so, so these are the classes of, of, order, of topics and individuals who are protected, if you will, under SIGMA. Next slide. So next category, outreach and engagement and transparency. So, I've touched on some of this already. You have to consider all the interests of the beneficial users and users. You've got to maintain an interested persons list. You've got to document decision-making process and how the input was used. So, again, separate from CEQA, where there's sort of like comment duly noted or there's some sort of big major table, the agencies, the state agencies expect that when these GSAs turn in their GSPs, they will articulate somehow meetings were held, this is the feedback we got, this is how we weighed that feedback, and we took that feedback in and weighed it in. We, and they have to describe that. Um, this is a direct quote. Encourage the active involvement of diverse social, cultural, and economic elements of the population within the basin. You will not find anything like that in CEQA or NEPA. Okay? Um, they have to operate under the Brown Act, as this agency does. And, of course, if you're not familiar with it, any agency uh, has to provide access to information consistent with the Public Records Act of California and be susceptible <coughs> to PRA requests. Next slide. So compliance. These GSAs are required to comply with local laws, local ordinances, states, federal, and under SIGMA, and um, this is a really quick abbreviation, under SIGMA there's annual reporting and then there's five-year reporting. Annual reporting is basically we've to update, this is what we've done, this is how we handle things. Five-year reporting under SIGMA, which will happen four times because it's a 20-year window. Um, the the, the five-year reporting is basically going to be the, this is how we're doing to achieve our sustainability goals. Within the first five years, relatively speaking, most people think the first five years, all the agencies in the state are going to be getting a sort of a, okay, show us what you can do, okay? If within the next 10 years or the first 10 years of so the second annual report, a basin just sh is showing that they're simply not achieving sustainability, more than likely, this is my professional opinion, more than likely, the state's going to intervene. Because he'll be halfway through Sigma, and that basin will have not made any headway to achieve sustainability. So every five years, you've got to report how we do. Next slide. <coughs> um, so, <coughs> funding. Um, these efforts have got to be done. Now, this agency, like many, many agencies in the state, took advantage of the Proposition 1, which passed in November two years ago, uh, proposals, and got about a million bucks to, to pay for doing the GSP. So they are, and a lot of other agencies throughout the state did that as well. Um, that'll pay for a good chunk, if not all, of the GSP. But then after that, this is a 20-year agency at the very least. Okay, and this agency has got to be funded. And the member agencies contribute to it if it's a single, you know, so, so there's that. And so in many places around the state, Prop 218 votes are starting to get developed because they have to get funding to, to run these, these, um, these brand new agencies. Um, so they can be, so funding can come from regulatory fees, property, property related fees or assessments, local taxes, everything that's up there, okay? But the bottom line is that, that these agencies have to run. They don't really have a choice because they have to be compliant or the state will intervene. The State Water Resources Control Board will intervene and take over groundwater management with their fee structure. That fee structure has already been promulgated and finished. It is significantly higher than most any other agencies I've seen in the state of California. The point being that if you think it would be expensive to do one led by your own folks or, or less expensive by the state, it won't be. It'll be significantly more expensive if the state intervenes. Next slide. Okay, now we're going to get into to broad, the specific authorities. So this is literally a quote, okay? Do anything necessary and proper to carry out Sigma purposes, okay? So that's a, that's a statement that's in, that's actually the right. 
you can adopt rules, regulations, ordinances, resolutions. So when I said this is a regulating agency, it is a regulating agency. Okay. Um, use any other authority allowed under the statute. Next slide. So now we start getting into specifics of what's that mean. Okay, that means that this agency, and again, these are the mays, not the shalls. Okay, that doesn't mean this agency is going to do this, but so you have a broad sense of what this agency is going to be dealing with, and for board members here, those that are going to sit on the groundwater agency, this is what it deals with. You can require, they can require, registration of groundwater extraction facility as a well. Okay, so they can require that all wells are registered and GPS and, and put into some major database. They can require measurement and annual reporting, with the exception, so when I talked about de minimis earlier, if you fall into the two acre feet or less, which most domestic you know, homes do, but the bottom line is this agency can require measurement um, and annual reporting. Um, it can defer cost of a water measuring device, a meter. Okay, so with the except, so if you're de minimis, you can't be. But all the parties that are not de minimis, the agency can not only um, enforce the installation of groundwater meters, or excuse me, water meters, but it can put the cost over to the individual well owner, rather than take that agent have the case on by the agency, um, and require that an owner operator can can uh, file an annual statement describing use. These are all the things that this that any agency in the state can do. Next slide. Information gathering. You can conduct investigations of surface or groundwater rights and related rights. You can monitor <coughs> surface water diversions. They can expect properties and facilities on, on, you know, or obtaining an inspection warrant. These agencies have warrant authority. They have warrant authority and they have the ability to do that. Groundwater extractions. I'm not going to read all this stuff, but they can put well spacing requirements. So go forward, this agency or any agency can say, from this point forward, wells will only be spaced in a certain proximity to each other so as not to negatively impact each other. They can control the extraction. So I think the flavor that I want you to get is, again, these are the mays, not the shells. When I talk about the GSA being a regulating agency, hopefully this is starting to get you, give you the flavor. It's not like, well, let's just study groundwater, it's not, I mean, it's, it's a big deal, to, to put it bluntly. Next slide. Um, it can establish extraction allocations. So like I talked about in other places in the state where there are critically overdrafted basins, several places in the Central Valley, the South Central Valley, the Borrego uh, Water District out in the, you know, the, high, or the, the San Diego, uh, east of San Diego, <coughs> almost certainly, almost certainly there are going to be lands that are going to be fallowed, almost certainly there's going to be allocation extractions that are going to, or extraction allocations placed upon individual well owners. The lands that go fallow, is the agency liable for some sort of a um, eminent domain or taking or any other kind of thing? That is almost <coughs> certainly going to get worked out in the courts right now. Now, the, the ideal circumstance is that lands that are going to be fallowed, or as we call it, um, demand reduction, will be brokered through some sort of buyout or something like that. So there'll be some sort of equitable buyout that's not going to go to an eminent domain dynamic. Um, but at the value yeah. before they made it fallow. That, that's, that is what's going up for debate. That's what I said earlier about there's almost certainly going to be losses. <coughs> there are going to be places in the state of California, not here, I, I firmly believe not here, but there will be places in the state where there's going to be winners and losers. Yeah. Right, thanks. I will say that one of the promises, if you will, the benefits of Sigma, if we can get through it and we can sort of use statewide advantages, there are places in the state where you literally have federal water contractors and state water contractors, and you've got communities that, have, that, that went really high and dry during the drought, and folks mm -hmm. like literally right across the street had water, but it was water contracted through federal water rather than state, and they weren't allowed, they, there were administrative burdens that, that kept water from being shared. I think that there's a lot of places in the state where, not for free, Nobody gets a free lunch or a free drink, but there's opportunities to sort of break some administrative barriers in the state of California and help fix folks out and integrate the systems better. Whether or not we're going to be able to successful doing that, we'll see, but it's, it's feasible. Um, okay, property acquisition. This, in any, age, any agency can acquire property, including rights. They can make improvements. Uh, they can acquire and transfer water rights. Go ahead. Um, they can manage, as is indicated here, wastewater and stormwater. They can transport, reclaim, <coughs> move water around. Um, right there, they can 
provide for a program of voluntarily fouling. Um, they can import water in. If they've got the infrastructure <laughs> capability to do so, they can import water in. They can purchase water and move things around. Now, in this basin, you have multiple agencies within you could do that. When you don't really have the infrastructure from outside of this basin, there's not a whole lot of options for that. I mean, you, you could probably with you know, Parisum or some of those guys, but um, but in places around the state, like I talked about, where there's proximity from one subbasin to another, like they're literally just right across the river, right across the road, there's the ability to, to build in the infrastructure to move things around, to try to keep people whole through an, infra uh, an integrated process. Go ahead. So we move on to enforcement. You can so if there's going to be fees associated with extractions, uh, the an agency can sue to collect delinquent fees. They can pursue civil penalties. So if you've got a water extractor who is basically flying in the face of what a GSP has said, so if there's an allocation and that that well owner is just saying the heck with you, I'm going to take what I want regardless of what your plan, civil penalties can be pursued. Um, there's a responsibility to coordinate with adjacent subbasins and counties if applicable. And in there's a there's a term in the regulations called management areas. I'm not going to go into super great detail, but it basically creates like subconditions. So because the writers of the regulations knew that groundwater basins aren't aren't homogeneous. You know, they're heterogeneic. There, there's you can have circumstances where within an entire basin you still have subconditions where one part of the basin has got certain, you know, a, 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 an obvious example is if you're a, a part of a basin that's right next to a river. Well, your water source and your groundwater elevation is probably a heck of a lot closer to the surface than if you're 10 miles away. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is this, is this applicable to us? It is. It is. Which it is. one? Pardon? Which one? Um, both. But in particular for this basin, I would say to you that the idea of management errors, particularly because I know, you know, because you have very different dynamics between the San Lorenzo Valley area and the way in which water is extracted here and Scotts Valley um, and, and the city of Santa Cruz for that matter. Um, water management areas could be completely applicable where you can, and the point being what happens under management areas is under Sigma, I'm trying not to get super deep in the weeds here, but under Sigma, when I, when I talked about those six uh, sustainability variables, um, you have to set what are called um, measurable objectives and minimum thresholds. Now, one other thing to, to give to you all is that for all of the, for any of the applicable sustainability criteria, where you're defined as being sustainable, and this is a bit of an oversimplification, but where you're defined as being sustainable is roughly where you were on January 1st, 2015, which is when the law went into effect. Now remember, that was right on the tail end of the drought, or certainly in the middle of the drought. So, so the reality is that Water conditions were ostensibly at their most impacted in a lot of places in the state. Groundwater elevations were at their lowest in a lot of places in the state. All incumbent other conditions were because we were in a long-standing drought by that point. Um, so when we talk about minimum thresholds, I'm just going to say hypothetically, purely hypothetically. Let's say you've got a groundwater elevation and your minimum threshold. Let's say the groundwater in any particular basin was at 200 feet. Okay, well, on January 1st, if it was at 200 feet, then that's your minimum threshold. Okay, if you drop below 200 feet for the next 20 years, you're out of compliance, you're out of, out of sustainability. The goal, ostensibly, would be to improve your groundwater conditions and get better than 200 feet elevation. But if you go below that, you, now you're no longer compliant. That's your threshold. Now, the key distinction for management areas is that different management areas can have different measurable objectives and different minimum thresholds. And that's important because in a, in a heterogeneic condition, one part of the basin can say, look, we don't want to be held accountable to what was going on with those guys because there's just no way we were that way. We had our own hydrogeologic conditions over in our part of the basin. And that's reasonable. That's why they put this in. Um, I'm pretty oversimplifying that, but the bottom line is that management areas are a completely applicable thing. It's allowed by statute. It's allowed by regs. Might be something that gets pursued here. Next slide. Okay, <coughs> technical authorities. Uh, you can access technical experts, do monitoring. They have to develop a water budget. That's going to be the focus of the next war workshop on February 9th. We're going to talk about developing water budgets, developing what are called hydrogeologic conceptual models. We're going to talk a lot about the geology of this basin and the complexity. And this is a fairly complex basin by their aquifers. Um, 
but they have to develop. That's one of the things within the GSP. They have to do a water budget. Yeah, Bob. And that includes possibly forecasting on population and growth for the area. It can. It's not mandated to. It doesn't. It doesn't have to include. But that would determine the water budget, wouldn't it? Some level. Well, water budget is sort of the checkbook kind of thing. So it's water in, water out. So if it's water in, water out, then you want to sort of talk about sort of water out in the future. Then yes. Then then grant then. Population projections certainly would be woven into it. And that's where, again, the flexibility, you have to have a technically defensible water budget. I don't think the state is necessarily going to say, thou shalt build population projections. That's a local decision. Um, next slide. So um, that's the roles and responsibilities. I want to pivot to the, the guiding principles, but I'll pause <coughs> and see if there's questions. No. Um, what can uh, SMIGMA do to recommend as a best solution if they decide to design and build infrastructure to increase water production and water storage, like stormwater collection and also building earthen reservoirs? And how, um, third part, second part of the question is how if that was the case, how can this, um, our agency, pursue funding for these projects? And the third part of the question is, how can SMIGMA uh, put pressure on our neighboring, uh, the central groundwater agency, the city and um, Soquel Water District, to pursue the most cost-effective um, projects in that same vein? more production, more storage, recycled yeah. water, et cetera. Let me try to go in order first class. Um, the, this is, so when I talk about the shallows and the maze and the local control, this agency, which we're calling SMIGMA, <coughs> has the authority to pursue whatever projects it decides it wants to pursue. Um, I'll get to this a little bit more in the, in the guiding principles, but on the guiding principles, one of the last one, uh, elements of the guiding principles is a commitment to pursue what they call integrated water management. The idea of, of being able to integrate, you know, like the emergency tie-in you have right now, and just you know, being able to integrate water resources around so everybody can be ideally kept whole. There's all kinds of infrastructure projects that can potentially be pursued. That is what this agency is going to have to do. That is what this agency will debate. So the what part to your question is, yeah, that's exactly what they'll do. Uh, the second part of your question about was, was funding, right? Funding. Um, you know, at this time, there is some new funding that came from the brand new proposition, Prop 68, that, that passed in the summer and now went into law as of January 1st. There is some money in that. Um, at this stage of the game, it's most likely going to be still getting focused on planning groundwater planning, because that's where these basins are still, you know, as I showed by those dates, they're still in a planning sequence for like the next two, four years, um, or three, two, three years. Um, I would be surprised if there will not be pressure on subsequent propositions uh, and bond opportunities, whether local bonds or state bonds, for further funding to support agencies for additional opportunities for infrastructure. Obviously, I can't make that commitment. I'm not a legislator, but I would be surprised if that's not going to be out there because you have, on the one hand, you have a law that says thou shalt be sustainable, and you have a lot of agencies that are going to be, well, we're trying, but <laughs> where's the money coming from? You know, we can't do it all on our own. Can I commit that? No. <coughs> but I wouldn't be surprised. Um, third part of your question, with the exception of being able to show that there are redirected effects, so with the exception of being able to show hydrogeologically from one basin, you know, hi, we're this basin, and you guys over there are doing something, and it is impacting us, we need to work together, um, there's nothing that mandates it. If an agency, so again, over in the Central Valley, where the sub-basins are separated quite literally by rivers, by tributaries, and there's already is, and it's going to be all kinds of finger pointing in the future, like, well, they're doing it, they're doing it, it's, you know, like, guys on other sides of the river. Um, that's a legitimate, can we show the redirected effects, they'll have to do it over here, that may be a harder, a harder nut. That said, 
good governance, good policy might indicate that that you know liaison from one agency would go to another agency and say, "Hi, <laughs> we're neighbors. What can we maybe do together? What can we invest in together?" Um, it's been tried in this region, sometimes successfully, sometimes not. So, we're excited. <coughs> okay, thank you. Um, I have a question about ecosystem services, the yeah. value of ecosystem services. Mm -hmm. Director Fultz touched on sort of the idea of <coughs> compensation for fallowed ground. I'm wondering if any groundwater sustainability agencies have taken a look at the value of watershed lands or recharge groundwater recharge lands and attributed or ascribed some kind of a water sustainability value to the maintenance in a groundwater recharge conductive state, in other words, close to pristine or facilitating groundwater recharge, stream flow recharge that recharges the aquifer, so that you're not looking at land use from a, a point of view of compensating a loss, but promoting sustainable water land use through some kind of reward right. for maintenance in a sustainable mode, and then fees or charges for impervious surfaces that degrade the value of those <coughs> ecosystem services. So that that type of thinking is, is happening in a lot of places. It's, I mean, again, we're, at a state scale, we are building a plane while we're flying. Okay? This, is, this has never been done before. Sigma <coughs> is quite literally a foundational, and I'm not, this is not a pun, it is a tectonic shift in water management in the state of California. Okay? Or as those of you may have heard Laird the other day say that when, you know, when somebody's got to admit that Texas got to it before California, that's probably not a good day. Well, Texas has had groundwater management for a long, long time, certainly before us. More specifically to your point, without getting too deep in the weeds on, on water rights and things, but also getting into the local the local authority flavor. Mm -hmm. I'm, I do not work for DWR and I do not work for the State Water Resources Control Board. They're looking for a basin, an agency, to show the effective tools that they have to achieve sustainability and to legitimately do it. They're gonna look at the technical data, okay? They're gonna, and if, they're, if they feel that an agency is pulling some sort of shell game, mm -hmm. they're gonna call you. Mm -hmm. it's, it's gonna be very rigorous. The reason I'm saying that is the following. If there is a legitimate approach, so to use your terms about, you know, can you compensate for impervious services? Can you, so rather than making Sigma punitive, can you make it a reward-based system? Can you or at least coupled with both. Or both, right. Yeah. So you build in the punitive, but if you can incentivize um, better land management tools, and you can you know, cumulatively expect that or hope for that, the state, I don't think, is going to care as long as at the end of the day your numbers pencil out and show can we achieve and maintain sustainability. You, you have the carte blanche as an agency to, to completely to do To come that. up with you whatever. Know, right, okay. come up with whatever. The only thing I will say, and I don't want to get super deep in the weeds, is that our groundwater laws, and our groundwater rights in the state of California are based upon correlative rights, okay? And, and that's basically, if you own land, you have the right to the groundwater before you, okay? And what Sigma is sort of doing, the blood money if you will, of Sigma was, Sigma did not dispense with correlative rights, okay? Sigma did not create appropriative rights like you have for stream, for surface water that didn't apply that to groundwater. But just like the freedom of speech has limitations, right? The old adage, you know, your freedom of speech doesn't allow you to yell fire in a crowded theater, right? Fire! You know? Falsely yell fire. Huh? What? Well, falsely yell fire. Right. Um, <laughs> if it's true. Don't lively lively okay. crowd. Um, Sigma basically says, yep, you got correlative rights, you can draw the water out. However, you can't draw whatever you want out because that's the allocation part, right? So when you start getting in, and correlative rights does not cover what are you recharging. It doesn't go there. It only says what do you extract. So to build that in, there's nothing wrong with it, but again, that's a local agency innovation. If to me, Am I allowed to, I'm sorry, I'm done. <laughs> the chair should be, you want, there's a question back there. Should I just call in person? Or? Oh, sure, call um, okay. if, <laughs> if there are no requirements for de minimis to, um, uh, to report what they're pulling out, how can a groundwater management a agency really 
understand what's going on. It's tough. There's a um, lot of wells around here. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, you know, there are over in Kern, for instance. Kern is the largest groundwater basin. Kern estimates they've got anywhere between eight and ten thousand or so private wells that would all fall into the category of diminished. Now, individually, any one of them is like a drop in the bucket. Collectively, that's a lot. That's a lot of water. Um, now, that said, <coughs> there are a lot of tools that are available by, by averaging a per capita water use. There's a lot of data that exists. There's a lot of data that exists, whether it's per capita per household and size of household, that you can literally extrapolate from you know, aerial photographs of what the footprint of the size is or, and correlate that to what's the known population of a particular domestic dwelling from the census tract. Or there's all kinds of things you can correlate and tie together and come up with some pretty good target estimates, can you be as exacting as if you had meters? No, you can't, but there there are various different geographic information system based tools that you can get probably within a, a better window. So you're not completely blind, but a little blind. But with, with no measurement of those private wells, um, I, you, you don't know what they're taking up and exactly. what's to stop somebody from pulling up a big truck and filling it every you know couple of weeks and and yes. whatever they're going to do with it. Welcome to Sigma. Cool. Yeah. All right. Your neighbor's got a problem. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. This seems to be really heavily dependent on funding. So my question is on funding, back to the bills. Um, is this, as a regulatory agency, does it have any power to lobby for better funding? Or does do we, as ratepayers have to go to some other institution? Do we have to go to our elected officials? Or does this organization well, have When you to say this power? organization, you mean the GSA or the Santa Barbara <coughs> Water District? Well, 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 I'm talking about the GSA right now. Yeah. Um, well, sure. I mean, it has, I wouldn't define it as authority, but it has, you know, it, the agency has the right of an ability to go advocate. <coughs> you know, I mean, it, it's, it, it, this agency and all other agencies absolutely have the right to go advocate to their legislators um, for new funding sources and, and things like that along the lines of what I was talking about. You know? Because we can come up with a list of we want to do this, we want to do this, and then we can attach a dollar amount to that and say we're ready to do this, but for instance, San Lorenzo Valley Water District just had a very high rate of increases. So right. we can't stack increases on top of increases. At some point, we're going to have to go to the state and say, we are willing and able to do this without paying any more funding. Yeah, and that's going to be a very common condition throughout the state. I'm, I'm certain of it. You know, because <coughs> most, I mean, every agency that I know of is, is earnestly moving forward trying to do this, but there are literal impediments. You know. Other questions? Okay, so we'll move on to the, oh, good. We'll move on to the question from Bruce, and then we'll transition to the uh, guiding principle. Who's chairing this meeting anyway? Uh, are you the chair? Well, Lois asked me. I'm the chair. Lois said I could call on people. So the okay. chair said I could call on people as they raise their hand. Well, you know, you, you give kind of a, my name is Bruce Holloway. I live here in Boulder Creek. Um, you gave kind of a punitive uh, uh, exposition here about what the state's going to do. State's going to do this. State's going to do that. State's going to do this. And I uh, just want to. state can do that. So you know about the uh, violation of the Felton Water Permit? No. Okay. Well, you know a lot about state water policy, right? Mm -hmm. But you don't know about Felton. Well, I, I mean, I know you and I've talked about it in the past too, because we, we we talked. So when I interviewed, so you, you do know. About, yeah, but I don't know like in depth. But you and I talked about it. Well, I mean, you can look up the water right, mm -hmm. and um, there's certain paragraphs in there that were expressly put in there for the protection of fish, uh, coho salmon, and steelhead fish. They're in this water right, and this was nailed down in the 1970s. Through a public process, I mean, you're talking about a public <coughs> process, got to do this, got to do that, got to have this, got to have that. Public process, those all took place 40 years ago. Nice. Right here, right here. There was an organization called the Save the San Lorenzo River Alliance. I know, mm -hmm. I wasn't here then, frankly. I've only been in SLV since 1982. But back in the 70s, the county, city of Santa Cruz, were all involved, state water, uh, state water board. Uh, Department of Fish and Wildlife, all involved. And they nailed down these specific requirements, specific, and this district has never respected those requirements for 10 years. This district acquired the Felton water system more than 10 years ago, 
and this district has never respected those requirements. So all I have to say to you, when you stand here and you say, oh, the state's going to do this, the state's going to do that, the state's going to do that, no, they don't. No, and for 40 years, the state water board has done nothing. And, and when I talk to people at the state water board, they say, oh, we're involved, we're, we're worried about the horrible dam. We're worried about the Delta Tunnels, or is it one tunnel? I, I can't remember how it goes. Uh, we're worried about the Delta Smelt, not the Coho Salmon. I, I, you know, the state is focused elsewhere, mostly. And so when you come here locally and you point your finger and you <coughs> say, oh, it's got to be this and it's got to be that and it's got to be this, um, I think it's a joke because the state does not enforce these laws at all. The only thing that enforces the state law are private plaintiffs. And when your contract is up, when your grant funding is up, you, there's a grant to the GSA, and it pays for your... Uh, I don't know where the source of funding for my for my contract is. My, my contract is with the agency. I don't know where their source of funding comes and, from. And the, the GSA? The GSA. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so I think the GSA has gotten... You know, half of the price of the GSP is paid through a grant, and part of that has been for you. So when the funding is done, and you go back to Sacramento, we're still going to be here. And maybe 40 years from now, whatever you're saying, the state's requiring this and the state's requiring that, 40 years from now might be the same story as it's been for Steelhead and Coho, according to the State Water Board's permit in Felton, okay? Nobody respects it. No one respects it one bit. doesn't matter how big of a public policy ever, public, uh, you know, uh, but you, I mean, process. you're aware I can't do anything about that, right? Madam Chairwoman, I'm, I'm just, may I ask you if uh, Mr. Holloway actually has a question, or is he planning to just... Well, I, it doesn't matter if I have a question or a comment. Uh, mm -hmm. question or comment's the same. No, it's not. Uh, we're not going to have conversation between people. There's the one audience. more thing I'd like to say. The question or comment is the same. It uh, is not. It's no different. It is not. Um, the, um, Could you please wrap it up, though? So beneficial users. Um, we're all up here, uh, those of us in the GSA jurisdiction. And I'm including the city of Scotts Valley and all of SLV Water District and Mount Hermon and all the private pumpers, all of us in this groundwater basin, and I am excluding the city of Santa Cruz, because the city of Santa Cruz has not been a groundwater user to date. And the only reason that they're in here is because they got a dam. They got two dams. They got a big old dam up there <coughs> on Newell Creek, the Block Lomond that we all know about, and they got the rubber dam down in Felton. And uh, in a way, these are intrusions. These are intrusions upon our environment up here in this basin area. And so Santa Cruz has somehow interloped into this GSA because they've already intruded. On well, I'm not Martin. sure, Bruce, I'm not sure if you were here so, on this slide. So, beneficial users, I'm just addressing. Mm -hmm. I'm giving you one more minute. That's okay, it. one minute. Santa Cruz, they've somehow wheedled their way in here, but this isn't really their GSA, it's our GSA. And and they've already intruded on us and, and now they want to intrude on us further in terms of groundwater. Yeah. You know, they, they they've already got surface water rights far in excess to what our district has. And um, they want to intrude further and they want to they want a slice of our groundwater. And I don't agree with that. Okay. Um, I, I okay, will thank you. <laughs> Call back to the yeah that, yeah um, I will call back just to the public that one of the early slides where I showed up the, the language about the statute about local agencies um, I will respectfully disagree with Mr. Holloway the any any local agency that has land use authority <coughs> or local agency that has land use authority and or water supply or water management authority legally by statute has a right to be a GSA <coughs> that's what the statute says how you work that out locally is entirely up to any base in the state of California, but any city, any county legally has a right to be a GSA or partner with the GSA. It just that's the statute. Next. John so, Ricker. Okay. Just to just add a little bit more to that point, the city of Santa Cruz gets about 40% of its water supply from the Santa Margarita Basin. 
the base and feeds the tributaries in the San Lorenzo River, which is the city's main supply. So they are a beneficial user of the basin and have been for probably since the 1880s. Okay. Thank you. So um, I have been working with the Santa Margarita Groundwater Agency in what was recently developed or recently adopted in December, um, which they are calling the guiding principles. Um, this exercise has been done in a number of places around the state where you have this kind of circumstance. We have diverse agencies that are coming together, partner together. Um, they have their mandate, because the mandate is set by statute, of how they're going to go about doing it, and do they have shared values and shared interests? They don't always. I mean, you know, all agencies are different. They represent different constituencies. So the guidance <coughs> of the process began with me working through a series of interviews with um, all the board members of the GSA. Um, I've subsequently interviewed some more board members that are of, the, of this um, agency specifically. I'm going to continue to finish those off with, with, with uh, some folks here. And likewise, some, some new board members um, in some of the other jurisdictions, uh, the, the, the member jurisdictions. Uh, I interviewed staff. I interviewed some community members at the time. Um, and came forward with recommendations, and the recommendations were basically twofold. One was the development of guided principles, and the other was the educational process that you, many of you attended and hopefully will attend in the next two months. Um, so the guided principles then, a, a, a committee was created, a facilitation committee was created at the, at the Groundwater Agency, uh, which in, included Chuck when he was uh, on your board and uh, representing this agency and other agencies, uh, other members, and we worked over a several month period to craft these, what I think are 14 or 15 different um, statements. Now some of these early on in the document are basically background, and, and these this is available on the Santa Margarita website, and uh, the agency website, they were available as handouts, and they will continue to be available as handouts at the, um, the subsequent workshops, and if you had gone into the the small meeting room, you may have seen the big panels if you were at the workshop the other day that, that presented these in panel form, and those will continue to be available. So, but a couple things that, that, you know, when I began working with them on is, you know, I talked about how guiding principles are sort of, we hold these truths to be self-evident. You know, when you get a group of people, or a group of agencies together, everybody inherently comes with different interests. That, that's just being people. Um, what you want to try to do with a new agency and then set the framework for the work of that agency for many years to come is what are we holding ourselves accountable to? Um, and can we see ourselves in a set of principles? You know, it doesn't mean that everybody sees themselves equally, but what you don't want to have certainly in an agency is where one set of, you know, one subset of partners just start steamrolling and doing something and some other members like, hey, whoa, 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 that's, that's completely anathema to what we believe in and all the rest of the parties are like, too bad. So this is a starting place. This can be a living document, certainly for this new groundwater agency. But a couple of things, for instance, um, can you enlarge it just maybe slightly <coughs> for my 50-something year old eyes? <laughs> okay. Um, well, we'll see. Okay, so um, it's, it's there we go. That'll work. That's better. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, so um, let me. I'm just going to, you know, um, so the, the, here's this, you know, this is a statement. It, you know, the agency represents and preserves the water interest of all beneficial uses and users equitably and transparently. There's a next bullet here, if you can go ahead and scroll up just a little bit, another item. So this one right here is where we introduce and talk about the, the agency. Now, to be clear, the agency didn't really have a choice about defending the, the concept of de minimis because the, the concept of de minimis was in statute. But they felt it was important to go ahead and, and state, we, you know, we're there. We recognize that the, 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 the agency is committed to the definition of de minimis and will explore opportunities to minimize sigma-related impacts to all groundwater extractors. Um, I've worked with this agency. I can only tell you that they seem to they legitimately mean it. They, they want sigma to be as unobtrusive and un as non-painful as possible. There was one that I, hold on, I'm just trying to find it. Um, uh, da, 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 da. Can you scroll, can you scroll? Um, sorry, okay, hold on. Um, there, 
Historic groundwater management, surface water management, and land use practice in the basin have created overdraft conditions in some of the underlying aquifers. The practices that created over, overdraft conditions were not sustainable, and the practices that took place will not be repeated by any member of the agency, nor any beneficial use in the basin. Now, you can look at that, and I won't blame you. You can look at that and say, that's mom and apple pie type of stuff. Okay. The flip side to that is that by virtue of me going out and talking, I'm not, I'm not taking credit for this, I'm just saying going out and talking to people, there is clearly, clearly, and rightfully so, frustration of past historic practices. This is a statement by this agency saying, we're not going to do it again. We're going to do things differently. Now, will they have to be held accountable to that, like all agencies? Yes. Will it take the people in this room to hold this agency accountable? Yes. I don't delude myself. I deal in policy for a living. But <coughs> I think that that's an important statement. Can you, you know, scrolling up? Um, uh, the next one. So here, number 10. Beyond minimum sustainability thresholds. Remember I talked about minimum thresholds earlier? Beyond minimum sustainability thresholds and objectives, the agency will examine <coughs> possibilities to recover and restore the basin's aquifers and restore tributary base flows to the best extent possible. Now that, again... Any one of you could look at that. If I were living in my community, I would look at that and go, well, you'll try, there's a possibility, blah, blah, blah. I get that, okay? But this is politics, and you have to sort of leave some room. The important thing I would like to submit to you is that what's being stated here by this agency is they could accept wherever the groundwater conditions are right now as being what they are. This is a statement where they're saying they want to do better. They want to try to recharge the aquifer. They want to try to recharge the base flows. It's going to take work, it's going to take money, as was talked about, but this is a statement of a principle that everybody's collectively in agreement. Yes? Are those base flows as of that, that 2015? <coughs> yeah, that's okay. the target. That's the minimum threshold is where things were at, at, on that date. Um, scroll down a little bit, or up a little bit. Okay, so number 13. The agency also recognizes its duties to taxpayers, ratepayers, and future generations to ensure that our financial resources are used effectively and responsibly as a tool to promote sustainable groundwater conditions. Now, I'm going to pause here for a second and just say in general, there's one other one I've pointed to. I do this for a living. I work with agencies for a living. There is inherently a, um, an early, we're just getting started kind of element to any, any organization I ever work with that, do, that does this. But I can also categorically tell you the following. Okay? And like I said, I work with a lot of different agencies. I've sat with agencies where I've worked for multiple years, and four years after they've done something, you've got a new board. People have been elected, they've been moved, they've done whatever. You've got new people. A discussion is taking place. Maybe somebody's intending to do something sneaky. More often than not, it's not. It's just people sort of trying to protect interest, and they're in a conversation. And somebody else picks up the copy of the guiding principles and says, I just got to say something. These are our guiding principles, and if we go the direction that member so-and-so has raised, it seems to me like it's flying in the face of these principles. Are we prepared to do that? I have seen this happen several times where people, it's a totem, they hold themselves accountable to this. So are these words on a page? Yes. They're important words on a page. This is the first step that this brand new agency has done to come forward and say, what do we collectively agree on? How are we going to collectively work together? Um, this, la this number 14, integrated, I think is a very key one. Integrated water management is a set of methods to extract, transport, store, use, and share groundwater through a basin. To support Sigma objectives and basin by water needs, this agency will pursue an integrated water management approach for this basin. It will honor the social, cultural, natural, and economic diversity. It will capitalize on diverse water resources throughout the basin. And it will seek to ensure that all beneficial users have necessary water resources. <coughs> An integrated water management approach may rely on, but may not be limited to, if you can scroll, science-based decision-making, projects and methods to recover and restore the aquifer, collective and individual groundwater use requirements. The point being that this agency has said, we're going to start looking into how can we integrate our water resources and keep people whole. That's a, that's a fundamental statement for a brand new agency. So they worked several months on this. Uh, these were adopted in December at the December agency. Um, now the agency has to be living to these principles. So this is the work that we've done. I'll pause for questions. Uh, Virgil? 
Yes, I'm sorry, but it needs to be changed. Yes, I mean, if the agency chooses yeah, to vote, change it. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any other questions out there? No questions. Oh. Yeah, these are so these are available on the Santa Margarita Groundwater website. Um, and I don't know if they're directly on the landing page, or I think there's a link on the landing page. Right here in the oh, sorry, thank you. Okay, so our next workshop is uh, the agency's workshop is going to be on February 9th again at Felton Community Center. The focus is. Uh, going to be on water budgets. We just met yesterday and started working, uh, advancing the work on the agenda. I'm pretty certain the following key, we know who our keynote speaker is going to be Assemblymember assembly Stone. So Mark Stone, uh, with, with very significant credit to your chair, who reached out today and, and uh, confirmed that. So I'm already in communication with his office. Um, we will be focusing on the following key items. We'll be doing some further review of Sigma regulations specifically to the GSP and how what those regulations are about how the plans start to get put together. We'll have, be having technical presentations by a number of the groundwater consultants that have been working for the last several months and years on what we call the water budget that um, uh, Member Fultz was, was talking about, which is sort of what's the water in, what's the water out. It's kind of the water checkbook or the water checking account. Uh, they'll be talking about this other item that we talked about called a hydrogeologic conceptual model, which I'm not even going to try to get into. Um, um, we'll be talking about the aquifer, aquifers and the geology of this area. We're also going to have a section on, um, on aquatic ecosystems and sustainability and start really talking about groundwater, surface water interaction, um, things like that. So that is going to be the general focus and speakers and panels. Uh, at this one, and then at the third workshop in March, it's going to be about watershed or water management. So we're going to then start transitioning into some of the stuff we just talked about, about integrated water systems, conjunctive use, so that's going to be the focus of that third workshop. So we're, we're trying to move along. I, I, I hope those of you that were there on Saturday found it informative and helpful, um, and we're going to be staying relatively in the same basic pattern of some presentations and some group discussions and report back, so we're going to keep the same basic model. Um, unless you guys have feedback otherwise, and by all means, let me know if you, if you have some other feedback. Okay. Please you? register on the Santa Margarita website okay. if you would mm -hmm. like to attend at the Felton Community Hall. We had over 100 people last Saturday, well attended, and hope you all attend. And I got to tell you, it really, it's, it's, really, it's really helpful if you actually register, <laughs> you know, please, just so we know. I mean, folks, because it's just, it's really, really helpful so we have a sense how many tables put up and just, you know, materials and things like that. So if you're going to come, register. If you know some people, you want to encourage them, encourage them to come. It just helps us have a handle on who's going to be there. Dave, I really think it's good for your blood pressure that we don't register and you get surprised. <laughs> no, I don't think you're the number of bagels like a good I have <laughs> It makes me not sleep very well the night before, <laughs> is what it does. <laughs> Like you're throwing a party and nobody's coming. A little like that, yes. <laughs> well, we really appreciate you coming and yeah. sharing all this with us. Thank you. Thank you for letting me go first so I can blaze on back, uh, back home. i got to get on the day. Um, so thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, it nice to do other interviews. And, and I, you know, I gave my email address. If anybody ever... I think Jen's got it. Anybody ever wants to ask any questions? You know, I, I, I work for Sac State. We didn't really say that, but I work for Sac State. We're, we're fee-for-service, but we're not-for-profit. I mean, we're by definition, we're third-party neutrals. That's my job. My job is to be a third-party neutral. If you've got something you want to talk about, if you want to get in touch with me, and you want to sort of send a message through me, I, I'm I, by all means, you should go to your elected too, but if you want to give me feedback on the workshop, whatever, don't hesitate. So if you can give my email address out, I'm happy to, to respond to anybody that contacts me. Oh, okay. Um, let me grab my stuff back there. So I'll okay. Thank you all. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you. So we're back to item nine. We'll see you. Yes. Okay. How many of you want to comment? There, we have a lot of people here, and uh, how many of you think you want to comment in oral communications on anything that's not on the agenda? 
Okay, I don't see a bunch of people, so I guess if you do want to comment, you can have three minutes. So, any comments? None? We're moving forward then. Okay. Unfinished business, board policy manual. Um, I think we, um, we need to move forward with this, um, but I think there's going to be a lot of changes. So, if some, I would like to move that we um, vote to accept the policy manual with, with a change, with a, about the times of meetings. Because when we talked before, it was mentioned that we wanted the closed session to start at 5.30, open session at 6.30, and open session would always be at 6.30, even if, there, even if there's no closed session. And I, I would like to make that change. I know you've been writing this, and so... Well, point, point of order. So, I, what you want to do then is to use the document that's included as the edit that I submitted as the document that we're going to uh, work on tonight and potentially pass tonight. That would be the document we're going to put into a motion. Right. That's okay. my. That's what I want to do. Okay. So I do have the word document up, and so I want to get to that. What well, Bob's don't we all have it? Why well, Bob's getting to that page? You don't have the word. You have the PDF. Right. So I can add it in here, uh, whatever we're deciding we want to do. Um, how about if we do, may I suggest a, a slightly different approach? That we go through what is in there, sort of edit by edit, see if there's any changes we want to make to it, and at that point in time I can make that change you're suggesting once we get to that point. Does that sound okay? Not really. Okay. Well, then. Um, I, I, I think we're really we're short right. on time tonight, okay. and we got a lot of things to do. Right, and so let, let me let me just make sure here we've got. Um, okay, regular scheduled meetings of board directors should be held on the first and third Thursday of each month at 5:30 p.m. at the district's operation building, unless otherwise specified by the <laughs> board of directors. <laughs> <laughs> so how do we want to reward that? At 5.30 p.m. for... Closed session. For closed session. Oops, let me get into the... the and and o open minutes. session will always be at 6.30, or time certain. Hang on. Mouse is... Because... If we didn't have closed session, we were finding ourselves here at 5 o'clock for the regular closed meeting. Closed session and 6.30 p.m. for a time certain for open session, uh, regardless of there being a closed session or not. <laughs> Doesn't sound good. Well, but 6:30 for open time certain for open session. Yeah. Okay. That's changes in there. So what my thinking here is, instead of spending a lot of time tonight because we've got a lot of people here that aren't normally here, uh, and I want them to have a chance to talk, uh, we can always make edits on the board policy manual, we could bring it up every month if we sure wanted we want to, to and say, hey, we want to change this. But if we go ahead and and uh, vote for what was worked on before and, and get that passed with this one amendment about the time... I'm of, good with that. Okay. So I'm, uh, is there any other edits or... Otherwise, I'm, I move that we adopt the, uh, well, the resolution. We're going to have to get a, a better way of 
being able to scroll back and forth here. <coughs> Still trying to get there. <laughs> you got to get a better way. I, I had one other idea that I'd like to uh, present. Okay. On the, I just want to make sure the board realized that page 94 has a response from council on uh, board stipends that, that was asked for at the last meeting. Uh, it's in your account. Oh, well, I, I'm sorry. Uh, did you? What, Bill? Oh, well, I, I noticed the board stipend, you didn't change it at all. It's still $100 a meeting, correct? That's nice. Okay. Um, the one thing that recently came up to my attention is on committee members, the public member, which my understanding was, and the board policy member was, that every, you know, January, with, ever since that I've been on the board, that we... You uh, know what? Elect, elect. That isn't what we're talking about, right? Well, there's a... And we the board policy members, I know, but well, well, I'm done with the stipends. But um, in the board policy manuals, there's a um, term for the uh, public member of the political um, public member of each committee. And ever since I've been on the board in the beginning of the year, we, you know, that was the, and it says in there that um, that the board is to pick, you know, a public member. So anyway, at the beginning of this year, we, we, I'd like to inform you that we did not advertise for the Environmental Committee um, public member, which I didn't, I didn't really did, I disagree with. So, but the, the, in the board policy manual, it says that each um, public member will be selected for that year. So there's a bit of confusion on the, the term of the public member on the committee member. <coughs> I, think, I think needs to be cleared up. It needs to, it either it needs to stay that way. It's one year, and that the, the member is to be um, decided, or it's whatever the, the rest of the board members think it should be. But my, in my opinion, it should be changed every year. It could be every two years, especially after election year, because I believe that the public member on the um, committee should commit to after the, the, the um, platform on the committee. So anyway, I, I do believe that and as a consequence to make this change on the board member that I believe that we made a mistake on not recruiting a, a new environmental committee member. We're going to in, be interviewing the current committee members. Well, I know that that's that anyway, that's my yeah, change and I think I think that needs well, to be cleaned up on that thing. So I'll I'll just well, I think it, I think it's clear in here right now. I yeah. do think that the fact that the environmental committee was not advertised for was was an oversight. Mm -hmm. But kind of a natural one as we were going through the transition and okay. part of what I would like to do uh, when we get to the committee appointments is to ask that the environmental committee be advertised so that we can fill that uh, hopefully at either the next meeting or the meeting thereafter sure. uh, to to catch us up with what we should be doing according to this policy. So that would basically open up the environmental committee. But right now, what we're talking about is just this policy. I think it's clear in there it is supposed to be for one year, and we're just going through some transition here trying to clean that so up. So you agree that yeah. you agree with me that it already it, it should be just one year. It should just be one year, right. and then we, we, okay. we clean it up. But Okay. But I want to cover that specific item once we get to committees. Right now, I think we sure. want to focus just on this. So I'm finally at the resolution. So I move resolution of San Lorenzo Valley Water District, resolution number 26, 18-19, that the board adopt the board policy manual 2019 based upon, and I want to make this clear, uh, it's the Exhibit A with edits. Let me get back down to that since we're... It's still Exhibit A, but it's edits by Bob Fultz, director, and that's the one that we're going to pass. Or that's the one I'm moving that we pass. Okay, I'll second. With the change. Oh, with the change. Uh, that's a question for public comment. Are you, uh, I, I, for just for clarity, are you, are you adopting the complete edited version and not, you're not going to discuss all the other changes? You're just going to adopt 
which is all the, all the other changes, or are you just adopting the time change? Uh, it's adopting the entire edit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've we discussed a lot of those sections here. We can discuss them as... A, a, I can still make the motion. It can still be seconded. We can still have discussion. Yeah, but okay. I, 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 I mean... We haven't had... Okay, you can have discussion, but there's still areas of the board has not went through yet, and you're adopting them, is my point. Well, my point is that we can change those things. We can bring them up again in other meetings and other board meetings, but this uh, board policy manual has been floating around forever. We, we, did, uh, we did discuss uh, all the edits. In fact, yeah. what I did with the edits here, if, while we're waiting for a second, uh, what I did with the edits, I actually reduced the edits based on a discussion that we had at the last meeting. Uh, so we're not consolidating the committees. There's other things that we pulled out. And all the things that are in there are were in the last uh, document that we discussed in, I think, an hour and a half, pretty thoroughly. And so at this point in time, I'm making this mo I made the motion with the, uh, that we adopt uh, the resolution with these edits with uh, Lois's one change. And I guess at this point in time, if there's no second, then it would fail. But I'm hopeful that there will be a second. It was seconded. Bill seconded. Bill seconded. Bill seconded. Thank you. Thank you. So at this point in time, what's to you? Uh, any comments from the uh, audience? Comments? Uh, I can't see who's back there. Oh, Bruce. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, I only have two comments. Uh, one is that uh, as far as the... Um, the rules of order for the meetings. Uh, that has historically been the Sturgis uh, rules of order, <coughs> whatever the name is, uh, not Robert's rules, rules of order. And I, I, I think switching to Robert's rules was uh, Brianism, uh, not really necessary. No. Uh, Sturgis, uh, Alice Sturgis was a noted uh, Northern California uh, parliamentarian who was on the faculty of both uh, Stanford and UC Berkeley. And uh, I think her, uh, in, you know, the, the rules of parliamentary procedure that derive from her, you know, from her book are simpler than Robert's Rules of Order is hundreds and hundreds of pages uh, that apply to a parliamentary bodies, you know, which is much more complicated than what we have here. So I don't see any need to deviate from the Sturgis rules. Uh, she's a noted uh, female, Northern Californian professor, uh, or was in the last century. Um, the other thing is the uh, number of votes it takes to, uh, to pass any kind of resolution for the board to do any kind of business. It's always three. The policy manual says a majority of the board. Well, I see five board members here, so a majority of the board is three. That's the same as a quorum. But if two people died, if there were two vacancies, it would still take three. Right. That's state law. As far as I know, it's been reviewed by the Attorney General. It's well understood. Same thing for the County Board of Supervisors. Now, City of Santa Cruz, different story. Down there, they've got seven council members, and according to their rules, if a quorum is four, yeah. and they can have a three-to-one vote. They can have a three-to-one vote and pass something or other down in the City of Santa Cruz, which is a, three is a minority of uh, seven. They can do it according to their city charter. It's not mm -hmm. state law, it's their city charter. <coughs> but for the county board of supervisors or for this board, it's always three. So I kind of think the words in the board policy manual say a majority of the board. And if the board only had three, if people you know moved away or something, um, if the board got to a point where they only had three, people might read that and they would think a majority of the board might be two. We could pass it, something with two. Well, you can never do anything with two. That's the rule. Nothing. Anything. Uh, three, it takes three. That's it. You can do anything with three within your jurisdiction, and you can do nothing with two. Thank you. I actually know that. I wasn't born yesterday, as you can tell. Um, <laughs> it takes three, so thank you. Um, anybody else want to comment? No other comments? Okay. You, Holly, you want to call for a vote here? All right. Let's 
So this is a motion made and seconded to adopt resolution number 261819 with exhibit A edits by Bob Fultz. With the change that Lois suggested, which is? Ama it was amended. Uh, with the change regarding the schedule. Yeah, and, I, and I've and i noted it down and I'll supply that to you. Uh, okay, so. thank you. I have it as well. All right, uh, Director Fultz. Yes. Director Smallman. Aye. Director Swan. Yes. President Henry. Yes. <coughs> Director Bruce. Yes. And just so you know, <clears throat> Director Fultz will be bringing this up again. Oh, I believe you. This is just okay. a threat. No, that's not a threat. That's just a promise. <laughs> so, uh, the next thing we're going to do here is review all the committees. And right now we only have two committees that have citizen people. So I would like anybody on LADA committee that's here, if they would stand up. And there's only one. Oh, uh, that's there's, two, there's two. One that's one opening and one okay. application. Okay, okay. yeah. Uh, so, I don't know when we're going to find somebody to come and give you an education on how to be an oversight committee, but I know there's plenty of, of examples out there of reports, and I think people in Long Pico have been waiting for almost three years. And it's going to take a, sound, a certain amount of work to get this done. And I would like to know uh, if you're both ready and willing to do this. But, but before you answer me, I might say to Jen, probably one of them, uh, not Jen, I'm sorry, uh, Jenny, that one of the changes we're going to make in that board policy manual is that there will not, one citizen person can't be on two committees. So you're going to have to think about what committee you want to be on and with no guarantee that you will be on a committee you want to be on. So I'm, I'm just putting that out there for you to think about. So... I'm, I'm asking if you're both willing to do the work that this committee's going to need to t do. Uh, you mean sending a preparing annual reports for the community? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. All right. Thank you. Okay. Now, um, the Environmental Committee. Uh, Jenny is on the Environmental Committee. Um, her time on that committee will be over at the end of this month and so I'm asking that we immediately uh, put out a request for people to apply for the environmental committee and that Jenny would have to, if she wants to be on the committee, to reapply. She can't be on two. Huh? No. Well, oh, okay. I'm, she can reapply. She, she doesn't have to reapply. She doesn't reapply. She won't be on. And even if she reapply, reapplies, doesn't mean she'll be on the environmental committee. That's all I'm saying. See, that change was not made, though, in the policy manual as of tonight. As of, as of no. Tonight, right. that's correct. Okay. So, okay. It hasn't been done yet. Tony? So can Jenny, um, so she can apply, and then if not chosen, she can still remain on this committee then. She doesn't have to resign in order to apply, right? Right. Okay. right. But if we change it, there's no point in her, if she wants to stay on LADA, there's no point for her to, re, to reapply. If we change it, it hasn't happened yet, but I believe it will. Because we want people to feel free 
to apply for these committees. I mean, this is fabulous how many people we got to apply for committees that hasn't happened before. It's fabulous. And I'm so happy about it. We want, we, you don't have to agree with everything we want to do. However, we did run on some pretty strong platforms. And if you're really major against some of those platforms, you probably shouldn't apply. But hey, you're free to apply. And we would not turn any way, anybody away who doesn't necessarily agree with us. So uh, if the board wants to, you want to talk about this? Bob? I'm, I'm not clear what we're talking about. Are we talking about the LADOC committee application right now? Or no, I ch I went general? over to the to the environmental, oh, and I yeah, no, hers is her time is okay. over yeah, by the end of the month, and sh if she wants to stay on the committee, she'll have to reapply. I'm not saying she'll be elected. I, I, I think though to put a put an advertisement out for um, environmental committee applications. Yeah. That's right. what I said. Yeah, I wanted as soon as possible. Appointment and be the first meeting in March. Give us the month of February. To, we've got this month's about shop to get advertisements out. Be out advertisement the month of February and then bring it back to the board for review. The first meeting in March. Okay, but whoever we pick in March, we're going to look at committees in December or in January. So whoever gets put on. The environmental committee in March, their time's going to be up at the end of the year. That'll, that'll also give us a little time to clarify. Something. Yeah, you'll clarify that. Yeah. The board policy. The board policy. make that a little yes. easier. Now, the LADA, the LADA committee will not be reviewed in the same manner? No. No. Okay. No. Uh, Holly? Well, I wanted to find out. So, in Jenny's case, she was replacing somebody that resigned. So what happens if somebody resigns in November? Is would the replacements term be up and we have to go out again? Well, if I'm some if somebody <laughs> if somebody resigns resigns in November, we're going to already be putting stuff out in in December for mm -hmm. but, what, committee so members. Then six months before, after six months, they then they would only them. get six months. So it would be six months. All right. That's all I wanted to know. Yeah. I mean, it's that's not written in stone yet, but that's in in my head. Uh, Bill? Well, I, I think some of these things that go in the board policy manual, it needs to be, um, you know, I think in the future we'll, we can do that. But if somebody does get appointed, um, like in September or November, I think it should be stated that their term is good for another year beyond that. And that, and I think, and the other point that I'd like to make is I think it's a, is a really good idea to not have a public member and, and more than one committee because and that that allows more. Um, I, and I kind of just said so, that, but yeah, that's we, that's going to be for another time. It's not. That's not policy right now. Sure. It's but not policy we, right now. And when we that. come back to the sure. table on this board policy so manual, we can so make changes. Yes. So that was why I was asking, are we now focused on appointing uh, someone to the LADOC committee? Because you had mentioned LADOC first. I was wondering if that's no, what I was just reviewing the two committees that we have people. I am going to go to, I, I, I'm getting there. Okay. I'm, I'm sorry. Nope, okay, you have something you want to say, Steve? No, no, I'm ready to go into the letter, I can see. How about out there in the audience? Tony, did I see your hand up? No? Or, oh, I, I saw uh, Bruce's hand up. Um, so, you know, uh, Vice President Hammer resigned in May and it was well understood, according to the rules, that um, anybody that got appointed to replace <coughs> Director Hammer would take office, you know, pretty much immediately or a month later, and would finish out the term. And that the new, the new person would be a newly elected director, uh, whether you know wh whether it was the appointee 
or the, some new person, whatever. So I feel like it should be the same thing. If, if, if Vice President Hammer had chosen to resign in November instead of, you know, May, well, still, there's a, there's a four-year term there, in that case, of a director. So I guess in a case of a committee member, it's a one-year term. But I don't, I don't think that if you appoint somebody in September, that means they get a 15-month term. I don't understand that. Um, you should have a clearly stated time when the term is, just like it is for your members, yourselves, and that's what you should stick to. Thank you. Well, I um, actually don't agree with that. I think that they, unless there's a huge abundance of people wanting to be on the committee, I think it's kind of a waste of the uh, board's time. I think that the person should be allowed to stay if they want to, because it's not an elected position. It's an appointed position. Well, we aren't saying we'll take them off, but we certainly can ask them to reapply, which has been pretty standard. And Chris Moran, you have? from Ben Longman. Uh, yes, I was that uh, public member on the Environmental Committee. I served on it for two years. I did not resign. I did not renew my application. I chose not to be on there. That's, I don't know if that's what you want to call resignation, but it was the end of my term. I understood that my terms were one year, and that's how I functioned on that committee. Um, John? Yes, let me ask a question. Do you say that you think you will be making a change to the board policy manual to not allow anybody to be on two committees? Do I hear yeah, that correct? Yeah, probably. Um, how did you come to that conclusion? I mean, that hasn't come before the board for discussion. I'm, I'm, I'm at a loss for how you're making that assumption and then basing um, you know, questions for one of the current committee members based upon that fact. I, I said it was a possibility, and there's going to be changes made. And when Jenny was put on two committees, there was nothing that said it couldn't be done, but there was nothing that said it could be done. And if you'll remember, there was some real shenanigans that went on that you were involved in. Um, then you need to clarify those in this meeting if you want to Why? say that. Yeah. Why? Yeah. You know. You're supporting everybody at that meeting. Knows. Do you want me to tell you what? Yeah, tell, tell me what the shenanigan was that is in your mind right now. Okay. We, there was a perfectly qualified person to be on Laddock. And you got someone to apply and bring in two ringers to be on that committee. And you voted for the three of them and not the person who was most qualified. And that's what I call so shenanigans. That, that, that was the judgment of, um, that's your judgment and the judgment of the board well, of that, that And that my judgment is, I slimy. thought that was pretty that was the judgment slimy. of the voters in November, too. So, wait, go on, go on. Um, so you are asking Jenny to make a decision now. I'm just telling her it could on, happen. On. And I'm not making her do it now. No. Okay. I can just say and it could happen. Well, I think you should bring back the discussion of whether you're changing that rule before you ask somebody whether they're going. And there it was will be discussed <laughs> at another board member, I mean another board meeting, if we're going to change that rule. It will be discussed. It's not going to be discussed tonight. I was just trying to give her a heads up what I think might happen. And she can ignore me. And the board can, uh, and the board has not agreed to this, and I have not talked to them about it. It's the first time they've heard it. So, okay. Anybody else? Well, I would just like to take a short exception to the ringer comment. I think it was it's mm -hmm. untrue and. Mm -hmm unnecessarily inflammatory. Uh, 
you brought two guys in who knew absolutely nothing about the assessment. The LADOC committee is an oversight committee, and it was put in there to protect the people in Lompico. And one of those guys at the meeting said that he had his arm twisted to be there. Yeah, that's what he said. Chair Henry, for Brown Act reasons, I recommend um, refocusing the discussion on the committee appointments. Right. Thank you. Okay, I agree with that, and I'm going. I didn't want to get into that. We're done. Okay, I'm. Uh, we're done. Why? I. I. We're done. Uh, we are now going to talk about the administrative uh, committee, and we have. Oh, we have a whole bunch of people applying. Andy, back there, uh, you're applying, right? Yes, ma'am. Well, and can you tell us why you want to be on that committee? Uh, I would like to be involved in uh, water and water policy in uh, my community. Okay, that's a pretty straightforward answer. And... Um, so another person that we have that, let's see, is anybody else here that applied for that committee? Yeah, I am. My name's Chris White. Okay, okay, Chris White. That's right, you did. And do you have a, a reason why you want to be on that committee? Uh, it, it would essentially echo the same exact reason as this gentleman. Okay. And I, I mean, I have legitimate concerns that this board has no reserves. This board has no strategic plan. Um, and you know those things concern me as a resident of this valley. <laughs> so if I can participate, great. If I can't, I'm okay with it too. <laughs> well, there is a strategic plan I saw the draft. for the district. There is one that needs to be looked at. You're right. Mm -hmm. It needs to be gone over. So um, <coughs> I don't know if it'd be a problem if we had two people <coughs> on that committee. Well, Does that throw things off? I mean, it still takes three to make a decision. I, um, Just two other applicants, are they not here tonight? They aren't here. Yeah. They aren't um, here. I did receive um, emails from several of the applicants and saying that they were are very interested and unfortunately they had other um, commitments on this evening okay. and so they were not be, would not be able to make it. Right. But they are still very interested. And okay ask that their um, applications be read. Okay. Okay. Like read yes, please read. So Tina Toe, um, Boulder Creek resident, and her um, application states have a master's degree in environmental science. I currently work in social science and would like to use my earth science knowledge for public good. I think there should be more scientists in leadership roles. And Tina attached her resume uh, with work experience uh, listed uh, currently <coughs> doing field interview or data collection for national opinion research at University of Chicago. Um, the next person was Melissa Jarvis Bounds, a Boulder Creek resident. Her application stated, I'm a 15-year resident of Boulder Creek. I intend to live here for the rest of my life. I have been a paralegal for almost 40 years. I want to take my experience in the legal field to assist our local community by serving on the San Lorenzo Valley Water District Administrative Committee. I believe my experience could be valuable to the committee and appreciate being considered for this position. Um, and then Chris. She, Chris is yeah, here. Chris is here. So those are the uh, four people. Um, well, so I was going to suggest is that perhaps you might want to consider appointing three people to this committee. Um, that would be a total of five, three uh, community members. I know from my service on this committee previously that there's an enormous amount of work that has been pending for quite some time, and I think additional hands might be um, a good way to make this committee uh, move through things faster. Okay, so we have Chris White here, and we have Andy Benker. Benker. 
uh, here, and so I'm, I would uh, like to put them on the committee. Uh, if somebody else has an idea on the uh, a third person, I'm, I'm open to suggestions. Any? I, I, I support uh, 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 Director Fultz's suggestion. In reading uh, Ms. Jarvis Bounds uh, application, I'm impressed with her background and would like to see those three members appointed. <coughs> 40 years of paralegal assistance sounds like a good uh, yeah. asset to have. Yeah, it does. Okay. Okay. All righty. So I will suggest that um, uh, Ms. Bounds and the two people that are here tonight, that we pick them. Tony? I'm, I'm just curious uh, now, how will, will they all be able to vote? Yep. No voting. Really? Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. Might get a little wild. <laughs> We're, this is an experiment, kind of, trying to involve more people but uh, when it comes right down to <coughs> the board's the board, right. the three committee members might want to outvote us, and then we're going to have a little a little issue. It, it's only um, it's only the sort of thing that they make recommendations. Yes, yeah. no voting. They right. make yeah. recommendations. Yeah. Yeah. it's just yeah. recommendations. And I just I did have that one one thought where they you could have one person be the member and the other two be the. Um, uh, I forget the word that alternate. alternate. An alternate, but that isn't in the policy right now. So I, I, I think that's a good idea. But we've got people tonight. It's not in the board policy. So okay. we got to work with that. Okay? All righty. Okay. Thank you. All righty. Um, Do we have a motion and a vote? Okay. I thought I just got to do it. Aren't I all powerful? You may think you are. <laughs> I would move approval of Andy Becker, Chris White, and Emily Jarvis Bounds as the three new public members of the administration committee. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Sure, Next in the list is the budget. Chair Henry, I recommend that the motion include um, a uh, uh, mention uh, as to what the new size of the committee is. To oh, the okay. Three you want to do that? I, I will append my motion with the yeah. following words, that those three new public members will now constitute a five-member committee made up of two board members and those three public members for the duration of one year. One year. And then don't you have to yeah. vote on the motion? And is there and a second? Is there, there did was. I hear us? Oh, Bob seconded it. Okay, we so we... Vote. Okay, you want to call it? Director Falls? Yes. Director Smallman? Aye. Director Swan? Yes. President Henry? Yes. Director Bruce? Yes. Okay. So next is the <coughs> Budget Committee. And do we have any of the people who applied for that committee here tonight? Um, Leanne Sanders and Lydia Hunt? So we don't have anybody. Hmm? Would you like me to read the applications? Yes, go ahead and read the applications. So Lydia, Lydia Hamlet from um, Felton, Wampika. Um, I have always volunteered and been active where I live. See work and volunteering summary with reference. I have experience to be considered for the Budget and Finance Committee. Being retired, I have both days and evenings available for attending meetings. Thank you, Lydia Hammock, attached to resume as well. Most recent uh, employment was bookkeeper for Highland Ranch's Property Owner Association, uh, ending in uh, July of uh, 2012. Um, it looks like she's been bookkeeper at a number of places until about the 2012-2014 time period. Um, and I believe was a uh, on the Laddock Committee briefly, but resigned from it for, um, I'm, I'm not clear, but did resign from it. Yes. Uh, the second person is uh, Lee Allen Sanders from Felton, um, 
and his application says, why I, Lee Allen Sanders, want to serve in the Budget and Finance Committee for SLVWD, attend, listen, and take part in Budget and Finance Committee meetings, learn what current practices are in place, discuss what best practices are currently in use, study and understand what the budgetary and financial structure of SLVW currently is, discover how to help improve processes in my area of assigned focus, help keep ratepayers informed about budget and finance committee approaches to challenges, be available to ratepayers to receive input from customers, offer program and project management skills to the SLVW budget and finance committee. Um, Lee is currently employed in gallery management, um, but I believe the significant work experience was at Plantronics as a marketing <coughs> manager for 24 years, ending in uh, December of 2004. Okay. okay. Okay, so I think we can only pick one person here. Uh, it's kind of awkward to try to pick two. Um, Why is that? Uh, hmm? Why is that? I, I, I just feel because it's, it's it's an even number. Seems like it ought to be a. I mean, we could do it. The committees are recommendation based only. It doesn't really matter. Right, that's true. But, so, D, I, all right, then let's go ahead and pick two. We'll pick both of them. Okay? The bench. Okay. Who wants to make so a motion? I move that we um, accept uh, Lydia Hammock and. Lee Allen Sanders as members of the um, San Luis Valley Water District Budget and Finance Committee with a membership of four. A second. Okay. Any, um, does anybody in the audience want to say something about this? No? Okay. Uh, you want to call for the vote? Director Falls? Yes. Director Smallman? Aye. Director Swan? Yes. Director Bruce? Yes. Did you forget oh, the chair? yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was looking ahead, sorry. Pay attention, <clears throat> Laws. Okay. Um, well, we had quite a few people on the engineering committee. It's a really hard one. Um, is there anybody here tonight that volunteered for the... And you are? Joel Rusa. Hi, Lois. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> I may know you, but... It's been a while. Yeah, other people might not. Uh, anybody else? Mm -hmm. Oh, Lou. How can I forget you, Lou? I don't know. <laughs> I was sitting in the corner, I guess. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, Should I say something if I have something to say? Yeah, you can say something. Now, I, I don't know that Joel wanted to say anything other than hi, right? <laughs> Did you want to say something? No, not particularly. Okay. All right. I have just a few comments. Hopefully my voice will cooperate. In 2014, I served at the pleasure of the Board of Directors on the Citizens Action Committee, addressing issues from the first grand jury report. In the next three years, I attended most of the SLBWD Board of Directors meetings, engaging in critical, engaging in mission critical issues like fiscal restraint and prioritizing infrastructure repairs. Now that the Water District has finally committed significant time and money to crumbling infrastructure, I am offering my time and furthering this effort. I believe my familiarity with the SLBWD, coupled with my experience in designing, manufacturing, installing, and validating high volume, high purity water systems the world over, mm -hmm makes me uniquely qualified to serve on the engineering committee. And finally, and it looks like this has already been decided upon, um, I recommend that based on superior qualifications for several engineering committee candidates, I encourage the board to consider placing more than one citizen member on the engineering committee. Thanks for your time and consideration. Okay. So, unless you want to read these others, or I already know who I, I want to... Well, I, I, do, I do think that we need to... Um, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll oh, okay. go through these quickly. Uh, this is Mark Smoley. Uh, recently moved to Felton and interested in becoming involved in the local community. My previous community involvement includes serving on the board of a nonprofit organization for six years, rebuilding together. I found the experience to be rewarding and informative. In addition, my professional experience gives me an understanding of the water district services 
In my role as a construction project manager for the last 20 years, I supervise the engineering and construction of utilities, including major water pipeline installations. In addition, I manage the installation of groundwater production and monitoring wells. And attached his resume, um, looks like most recent employment was at uh, Apple. Project manager for construction of all utilities on the new campus. Wow, that's, that's a big, that was a big project. Right. Yeah. Whoa. Um, yeah, the old HP uh, campus. Um, next person, Susan Miracle. Uh, her statement, I'm fairly new to the mountains and would like the opportunity to get involved in the community. I'd like to better understand my water supply. I'd like to understand my water supply better. Uh, she wrote it the way I just read it, not the way I tried to read it. I am a power electronics engineer with Lockheed Martin. I've been an HO president and teacher. Uh, Joel, of course, was here uh, and worked in the um, Felton system, I believe. No, Joel didn't work in the Felton oh, system. Sorry. He's um, worked for us. SLBWD, I'm sorry. Um, Doug Fraser, I am an experienced water engineer with over 40 years of experience in design, construction, operation, and maintenance of industrial and municipal water systems. My most applicable experience at SLVWD was as a technical services manager and senior project engineer at CalAMS monitoring system. I also worked in the Felton system prior to turnover to SLVWD. That's the first time I was thinking of it. Um, and managed the transition, managed projects involving pipeline main replacement, well rehab, tank construction, rehab, arsenic treatment, ASR, desal. I spent close to a year working for the Santa Cruz Water Department, training roles in engineer at Graham Mill Water Treatment Plant, particularly looking at watershed issues and impacts of seasonal water quality in the system. I believe I am qualified and familiar with the unique issues facing SLVWD and as a ratepayer who is frankly shocked at the increases <coughs> we've experienced. I think I can lend a critical but objective eye to oversight. Please refer to my LinkedIn profile here. It gives a link in link. And then boom. That's the five people. Okay, so I think we ought to pick three, and I, my choices, uh, not necessarily in the order I'm going to read them, I'm just going to go through the, I, I think Mark Smoley, Smoley, is that how you say his name? I, 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 I think he'd uh, be great. He's got <coughs> construction, project, management, uh, things. Um, Joel. He knows everything there is to know about this water district. Go do so. So I would like to see him. Um, and Lou Ferris also. So if there's, uh, if, if any of you want to say who you'd like to have. Um, yeah, I'm in agreement with, uh, with my vote anyway, is Lou, um, Joel, and Mr. Joel Buza. And, um, but I, 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 I kind of like the Doug Fraser better than, um, Mark. anyway, my vote goes for Doug Fraser instead of Doug, whatever that, Mr. Smaller. Yeah. And just, that's just, right. um, my preferences echo yours. Okay, I thank you. So. Um, what about you, Steve? I like all three of those that you mentioned most. Okay. And Bob? Yeah, I agree with Okay, any remarks from the <coughs> audience? Why, no, why not take all of them? <laughs> Just too many people, too many. too many people. They all sound wonderful. Mm -hmm. we, we would spend a whole lot of time arguing, <laughs> right? <laughs> Which is, I mean, it's fine, but you got to be able to come to some kind of conclusion of what you want to recommend to the board. So, um, any other comments from the audience? Okay. Um, so, I, I'm, um, I, I think four of us went along with my idea of who should be on the committee. One order, I'll just make a motion. Okay. I move that we accept Mark Smoley, Joel Busa, and Luke Ferris as members of the Engineering Committee with a committee membership of five. Second, second that. Okay. 
Okay. Director Falls? Yes. Director Smallman? Aye. Director Swan? Yes. President Henry? Yes. Director Bruce? Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, just one comment. I mean, I, I echoing yours. I think it was great that so many people uh, applied. It, it is, I think, almost unprecedented. And for those people that didn't get appointed to a committee, um, <coughs> we are going to be looking for other ways to um, uh, bring more citizen involvement into the district. Um, this is our third meeting, and we haven't got all those plans lined up yet. But we are. Uh, I do want to make sure that there's a place for everybody that wants to serve the community <coughs> and learn about our water district, that, that there's a place for them to do so. Do we, uh, just a question, do we reply to the candidates that weren't selected and thank them for participating and invite them yes. to the community? Yes, we do. Yeah. Okay. And they can be in, they can come to meetings, let them know when the meetings are, <coughs> and come and comment. One thing about committee meetings, there are a lot a more relaxed and people get to comment more and it, it would just be nice if all these people who've applied because it is great this has just not happened um, I'd like to see them come to these meetings and participate even if they don't have a vote they've still got a voice so so, um, we have one more, and that is the Lodic Oversight Committee. And Deborah Lowen, would you like to, I mean, she's done this I don't know how many times, but would you like to stand up and give your qualifications for this committee? I, I would be happy to give an abbreviated version, since I've been giving pretty extensive ones in the past. Um, I served on several committees in Lompico, the last one being the Citizen Advisory, which did a lot of work on preparing the community for <coughs> answering all the questions about the merger. So in that light, I am very, very familiar with all the items that have to be done on the uh, assessment district, the engineer's report. I'm very, my husband and I have been contractors for over 30 years, and we had a business, and a, I'm very familiar with understanding plans and project management. And I know that there are a lot of questions in Lompico that have remained unanswered. And I think it's really time to address those. <coughs> I'm really excited about answering, to, to moving this committee into a whole new realm. And that is as defined by the grand jury report. And also on the platform of the three of you who ran, you extend it even beyond what the grand jury minimum requir requirements were to make this a really viable committee. And I fully support that, and I'm really looking forward to doing that, and I'm so happy to be able to apply with you. Thank you. Okay. So I would like to recommend that we pick Deborah Lawn for this committee. I'll second. Okay, so that was a motion. I just recommended. I didn't um, make a motion. I'll, I'll make a motion to appoint Deborah Lowen um, to the letter committee. Um, and and just real quickly, um, what I wanted to mention before is the letter committee is a different animal than the public committee. So I'll leave it at that. That's what I wanted to talk about earlier. But anyway, I, I make a motion that uh, Deborah Lowen as the um, one that does the letter. I'll second. Want to call for a vote? Oh, we do public discussion. Oh. Anybody want to talk? Well, I, At home. Home. I wholeheartedly am recommend to also <coughs> chair of the latter committee. Okay. Right. Anybody else? Okay. Uh, you want to call the vote? Oh. Aye. Director Fultz? Yes. Director Smallman? Aye. Director Swan? Enthusiastically, yes. President Henry? Yes. Director Bruce? Yes. Okay, the next item on the agenda, and I'm going to turn this over to Rick. Yes, I will turn it over to our environmental analyst, uh, Jen, to do the uh, introduction.
Great. Okay. So, um, just a quick little brief description of what this is about, and then I'll and then I'll go a little bit more detail about the projects. So, um, we've been talking for a long time about the USDA loans that we're getting to that we're hoping to get in order to fund some of the CIP projects. And um, so this is an initial study, which is a requirement from CEQA in order, this is like the initial step to do the CEQA permitting for two of the projects that are in that bundle. Um, this, is, this is not required that we actually bring this to the board tonight, but it kind of gives an extra layer of transparency in order to to um, bring it to the public. We do, have, like Dave was saying earlier, CEQA has sort of just like minimal requirements to just provide information and have it available. It's not necessary that we actually bring it to a public meeting to open up the comment period. We do, um, we will be posting it if it passes, if you guys accept the initial study tonight and we can move forward with the process. This is just the first step and then we will um, put it in the newspaper and send out notifications to neighbors and all the things so that people will know that this is happening and have an opportunity to comment on the initial study through the CEQA process. And then you will have the board in, in I believe, um, March? I said it in the, in the uh, February 21st, the public hearing will be held. And that will be here at the board meeting. So this is just opening up the comment period. They have 30 days to comment on um, on the project, and and then they can also <coughs> have a meeting and make any comments if they have any questions or concerns about the project and the uh, environmental impacts that are associated with the project. So I'll quickly read I'll read the um, description for the projects just so people know what's going on. This is for two pipeline projects: the Lion Zone Pipeline. The Lion Zone Water Distribution System project consists of replacing six-inch water distribution line in the Lion and Big Steel zones with approximately 5,600 linear feet of 12-inch ductile iron pipe. The new pipeline will parallel the existing eight-inch line, preferably in the same easement, beginning with the Big Steel Lion and Little Steel Lion Reservoirs and ending at the inter intersection of Central Avenue on Lowman Street in Boulder Creek. The current pipeline goes through homeowners' yards, under houses, making maintenance a challenge. Past analysis <coughs> that if the existing line were upsized, the water could flow from the Lion Tank and Big Steel Reservoirs <coughs> up um, on the hill above Boulder Creek to the, the Reeder, Blackstone, and Bear Creek Reservoirs, which are other tanks. I'm not exactly sure where those are, but no. Um, and that would add flexibility to utilize multiple supply sources throughout the water district. Um, pressure release valves will need to be installed as well. And then we have another tank um, pipeline that is the Sequoia Avenue Pipeline Project. <coughs> and the Sequoia Avenue Pipeline Project is to um, prevent water losses and surface out service outages in the reader pressure zone. The existing six inch cast iron pipe is in extremely poor condition, experiencing two breaks annually, which results in major water loss. Several hundred customers service is interrupted to fix these breaks, and the proposed project consists of the following. To remove 800 feet of existing six inch pipe located above ground, and supported by aging redwood timbers along the Sequoia Avenue. And then installing 800 feet of 8-inch HDPE water main and appurtenances to replace the existing above-ground section of pipeline along the Sequoia Avenue. The uh, alignment of the new main will be out in the Sequoia, out would be in the Sequoia Avenue right-of-way in the road. Um, <coughs> surveying is required to confirm the location of the right-of-way and abandon the old section of road. The, um, the new pipe will be constructed above ground on supports, and the construction includes connections to existing surface laterals, fire hydrants, as requested by the fire department, and to district standards. So that's kind of a brief overview of what's going on, and then there's more detail in the initial study. 
all the detail you could ever want, 800 pages of it. Yeah. And uh, yeah. so if you're interested in it, review it, make comments. You can either submit them in writing or, or come to the next or the board meeting in February 21st to uh, see those comments verbally. There isn't anything we do tonight. So though. what you do, what, what, we're, what we're recommending is that the board approve the initial <coughs> study and, um, and open up the comment period. So approve, initially approve the, the initial study and then you'll have another opportunity to, to approve the initial study okay. after the comment period. Okay. So, Bill? Uh, I was just wondering how much this report costs for this trip. Yeah, that is a good question. I don't know that number off the top of my head. Yeah. You know, approximately? But, you, know, yeah. you know, we are working with Raincon uh, Associates to okay. do the permitting for the USDA loans, and I... It's all not... part of the, the USDA loan package okay. that we're doing and this is with the WS, WSC, and this is a portion of it. I, don't, I can get you a break. Can you now. figure that out for me? I can get it for okay. you. I don't want to give you a number off that. Okay. The initial rain con overall was only around like eighty thousand. Right. I think for their work. Yeah, and there's other pipelines that you just don't see here because they're like the California Drive pipeline. It's all in the pavement, so it doesn't require the type of review. The Heen Road uh, pipeline is in the pavement as well. These two uh, pipelines have sections of pipeline that are going through possibly red-legged frog habitat and other types of habitats. Why they're outlined. Right, so this is a, I didn't mention that this is a mitigated negative declaration, right. which requires an initial study. And the other pipelines will be a, a negative deck, so there won't be a, an, an initial study associated with those. <laughs> $80,000 is a, approximately the going rate for this kind of um, review. <coughs> okay. Any other, Bob? Uh, yeah, a few questions. Um, approximately how much of the pipe is going to be above ground? versus below ground on these projects? Uh, I would say uh, just these two projects here, 100% um, or 99.9% underground. Okay. Underground use? Yes, under, okay. in, in the ground. That's yeah. correct. Okay. I thought I read Sequoia somewhere that was Sequoia was Well, Sequoia may be on the cross-country part. I, I can't give you that exactly. Yeah, Sequoia will be where it goes across some timber. It'll be above ground, but it's a very small part. Um, and then I know uh, Lion Zone it goes down Highway 236. Um, yeah, I, I, I can get another uh, well, I, I just, on, uh, Sequoia. Yeah, I mean, I'm uh, the general principal above ground pipes. Is well, my favorite, Sequoia's I access why. is almost impossible no, to get in with heavy equipment. You could, but then you do a lot more damage to the environment. I understand. To uh, do right now, it's 100 percent above ground. Right. Uh, and that's a lot of the problem, but it's the type of pipe they use too. But a joint, some welded steel um, in a heavily timbered area, and uh, the redwood timbers over the years have disintegrated due to dry rot. And it's cast. How old is it? <coughs> it's old. <laughs> it's old. If it's cast, then but it's there is some, there's some of that above ground, and that'll be done probably most likely with HDPD pipe, which is a more flexible um, pipe that. Uh, what, for the part that's above ground, what will be the expected life of that pipe versus the life of the pipe below ground? I don't know if I can get that question for you. You probably should know that as part of a... I think it's going to be about the same because the pipe is a 100-year pipe or better, or they haven't determined what the life of that pipe is yet. Because I'm hoping to use this as a first entry into the new inventory uh, <laughs> that we want to do. Um, what is the lifespan of this report that we're adopting? That it, does it have an expiration date, <coughs> at which point we would have to redo it not, by no. re-spending more money? No, I don't believe it no. expires. And the projects are not scheduled to be constructed until 2020 for the Lion Pipeline and 2021 for the Sequoia Pipeline, I believe. Uh, I, report said. I'm... So that, that is assuming we do get assuming the Assuming we get the long. funds and everything goes through. But yes, these don't expire. And so as long right. as conditions don't change, which we don't expect them to. Um, never, never expire. I've never seen a government report that doesn't have an expiration. Expire. I mean, they should be good until we do the project. Right, this right? Is, well, this is for the installation of the pipe. And once, you know, it's 
Well, what There's I'm, what no I'm reason to believe it's going to uh, yeah, the, expire. The reason I'm asking is, let's say something goes sideways with USDA. I mean, there's a lot of really weird things like going on in Washington right now. Yeah. I mean, I, I, well, I mean, I don't know. There's so we're on hold right now with the USDA until the government reopens. Yeah. We've got a commitment, and we're locked in at an interest rate. But um, do we have, do we have a commitment from them in writing that they are going to definitely do it, and it's just a matter of paperwork? Yes. Well, that would be really. Really great news. I, yeah. I did not know we had something in writing. Well, we haven't. We haven't. We haven't gotten the document. But we have an email from them. You know, it's not like on head. Like they were hesitant on. as we signed the final papers the day before the government shut down. And they have. <laughs> so, <laughs> and Sounds their like comment says, "Just be careful on releasing this because we are going to the government shut down." But, but the guy that sent the email was in a position to make that commitment, not a... We have not, we have not gotten the official <coughs> from them, but that's why we haven't brought that to you. I, I, I appreciate that. Thank you. Okay. Uh, that's Margaret, good news. Margaret, you want yeah. to say something? A question along the lines uh, that, that Mr. Fultz raised about the above-ground pipelines. Even underground pipelines can be vulnerable to certain impacts. What we saw in the Camp Fire and the Santa Rosa fires was that they burned hot enough to actually burn the pipes, melt the pipes underground. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Correct. Is there, I know you and I have talked about how incredibly horrible that impact would be for us if our watersheds were to burn. Is there any information about the kind of pipe that would withstand those circumstances better? Like, I don't, I don't know if it was plastic pipe under the ground it was, it was or HDP, metal pipe. It was HDPE product. Or, you know, the, the ductile iron pipe would probably mm -hmm. would not have those wouldn't, wouldn't melt. Oh, it was the HDPE pipe. If it melted, we would have much, much bigger problems. Yeah. <laughs> but if, the, if, you're, if you're putting the HDPE above ground for its flexibility, does that also give us some vulnerability That's to correct. fire? That's correct. Mm -hmm. okay. Yep. That it can do. Not as much you know, we try to design out as much as possible, but right. there are certain things that you know, we would know that that would could be possible. Okay. It's a lot easier to install, less cost effective. Mm -hmm. right, right, Bring right. in a heavy ductile iron pipe. Right. Like that. uh, so, it's the trenching in the above ground, and then you'd have to trench yeah. for certain. You know, there's, there's ways to do it, but then you start really escalating the price. Sure. Uh, Steve, did you want to say anything? No. <coughs> okay. Uh, Bob, you had your yeah, paw up. One, one, <coughs> one follow-up question. Now. Is there a, uh, I'm assuming the answer is yes, but how much is the difference in cost between the HDP and the, what you call it, the ductile? The ductile? Yeah. I can give you that without doing the cost analysis. Particularly for the part that's above ground? Yeah, and that, we'd have to do a cost analysis. I'm not throwing any prices out. With the type of prices we've got back, um, I, I wouldn't even begin without actually setting down an engineer's estimates or, or out the window. Right now. Yeah, uh, I mean, that's been our experience in the last yeah. few. Yeah. Um, but I think it would be interesting to know relative it's at to least twice as much. what um, Margaret was talking about on the fire. Is it, if it's easy enough to replace, it's like a, oh well, it burned, it melted, here's another piece and we replace it, mm -hmm. without too much disruption to the system, or is it so disrupted to the system that it might be worthwhile investing in the ductile iron above ground mm -hmm. because replacing that particular two foot section is just such a yeah. pain in the neck? Mm -hmm. I'll recommend going um, with a, in that area more of a well detect because that has ground loop. That area also has ground loop. It's not just the wooded area, but it's steep. Um, it does have ground movement in that area. There's a, a, a slide around the corner from it, and there's other slides that. You know, which are very typical. You need to put in a slinky. But yeah. you would you would look at a <laughs> welded or, or something different. But it's not too untypical in the rest of our distribution system. Yeah. And okay. Bill, you. you wanted to say something? Oh well, yeah, HDP is just really. I mean, I know this is a lot of because it's very durable. Mm -hmm. It's uh, light okay. and easy to install in these areas, um, et cetera, et cetera. So okay. what you said, Margaret, that was right spot on. That it, I think a lot of these can just be replaced right away. If there was, so I think it's worth mm -hmm. it's worth the risk of that one section might melt or whatever, yeah. and then we could just replace it rather than spend the extra money for. Unless it. you really need that water to fight a fire. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're just saying. Yeah. So, uh, Margaret, wouldn't you like to make a, a motion to here? Move approval. Oh well, after well, we have public comment. Well, you can make the motion and then we can have <laughs> we it. Could, any public comment out there? Lou? 
Uh, Rick, if I may, I think the cost differential of the piping itself would not be as substantial as one might think. But the installation cost is very substantial, and that's where the cost difference comes in. Just to make that clear. Okay. Yeah. I was thinking the same thing that uh, Director Bruce said at the at the end that um, one of the benefits that I've heard about, uh, in addition to increased water pressure of the larger mains, is um, it would provide superior uh, firefighting capabilities. Uh, because they'd be able to get more water. Um, but if the pipe melted, would that cause a serious impact on the ability to fight fires? That would be just one thing that popped into my head immediately when we were talking about it. Well, if we had a forest fire, it's going to be fought from the air. What the what really affects forest fires, though, is if buildings get out of control, and that's where the firemen come in and our, our pipes, our, our um, hydrants, to fight house fires to keep them from spreading, spreading. spreading to the forest. Okay. And if, if we don't get those taken care of, we're in big trouble. That's right. Absolutely. So any other comments? <clears throat> All right. Okay. I, 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 first off, I would like to acknowledge that this was actually a really cool study to read, and, and I thought it was very well done. And I haven't got, had a chance to go swimming in a secret study in a while, and it was a nice deep dive. It's like reading two, ma two, two novels. novels. <laughs> <laughs> so I would like to move approval of this initial study and open this public comment period time and hope other people will be geek out on it as much as I did. That's so okay. Okay. Uh, Holly? Director Fultz? Yes. Director Smallman? <clears throat> Director Swan? Yes. President Henry? Yes. Director Bruce? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I guess I'm... So the next item on the uh, uh, Agenda is uh, SLVWD prohibiting uh, prohibit prohibition. I can't of glyphosate. <clears throat> so discussion and possible action for the board to prohibit <clears throat> glyphosate. So, um, Bill. Um, well, actually. I, you know, I, I wanted to make this resolution, but my understanding is that we need to do it and create an import based of um, pest management plan. So that's the only reason why I didn't think we even needed to do this. But that said, what I don't agree with, and because we're, we are going to ban glyphosate, that's simple. I mean, that's, that's what the voters sp spoken, and that's what we're going to do, and that's what's going to be an invasive pest management plan. So this resolution, what I, I think that what we just need to scratch out, that this is a permanent <coughs> ban, that we should just go ahead and vote on a permanent ban, and we don't need, we should just cross out the words until the in, an integrated pest management plan is developed, and just cross that out, and just ban glyphosate, period. And then, and then we'll get to work on this invasive um, pest management plan as soon as possible and get that passed. And that plan will ban herb any herbicide or pesticide, period. But my understanding is the reason why we have to make that plan is like vinegar is actually a, um, a pesticide, but it's a completely safe project. I mean, not pesticide, but herbicide. Well, yeah, pesticide. Um, so, I mean, it needs, so that in, in the base of pest management plan needs to you know, need some complex language because there are herbicides and pesticides that are completely, you know, safe. But we want to, we basically want to ban all, you know, the things. So, I mean, I'm in, I'm in favor of this. I just think we just need to cross out the thing and then make a permanent plan. If on. I can just quick, let's interject and <coughs> get into discussion. 
the intent was to bring this to the board and to do your ban, but to do a, a permanent ban, if that's what the board so be to desires, as part of the integrated ma pest management plan, to give it the right form to let it vent or let it get through the process, let transparency, let the people review it, to have <coughs> public meetings on it through the environmental committee. And that's what the board's plan is to, or that's what the decision is to ban it. The ban as part of the. Uh, pest management, uh, re, uh, integrated pest management policy, and that's what we'll have all, you know, we also have other areas in the district that we use for like vector control that needs to be reviewed, and possibly we want to reach out as part of the integrated pest management to other agencies utilizing uh, herbicides in the watershed, you know, not just the district, it's a full integrated pest management. I know Jen will probably want to speak to it a little bit more, but I think we should go through the process, and then in the meanwhile, we'll ban. We, you'll have a ban on it, a ban on it. But give the process and transparency to the people to talk on it. Or you can just move. You know, obviously yeah. the board can just move right ahead and do what they want. Well, yeah. But I mean, this I just, board is big on transparency and like to work with people. So yeah. Well, my my concern is that what you're saying is that there's wiggle room that the invest invest or pest management plan. <laughs> Will approve the use no, of glyphosate. That's not what I'm saying. Well, then, then it should be that's okay. Then just scratch the scratch the the, the thought, half, second half of that sentence and make the the, the ban on glyphosate. No, I just permanent. think we go through a process that leads up to whatever you want to do. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's the process worries me more than just the ban. It's how we get there. Yeah. Um, I like to be as transparent as possible with it and give everybody a chance. Okay. But you can, the board can, you know, obviously do what they want. Am I correct? Yeah. Are they want to just go out now ban uh, uh, Yes, that's uh, within the board's power to pass right. a permanent ban. Um, I thought we go through a process, and that's totally up to the board. That's kind of just, just, I want to say. I know uh, Jan, do you want to add anything to an opening statement? I'd like to read the read the memo. Okay, and I just I didn't and staff wasn't prepared tonight to to debate the use of plastic. That wasn't the intent of tonight. Just the intent to get a ban or stop. Good. You want to say anything? Who else do I know? Um, can I maybe the yeah. demo? Yeah, please. The district owns over 2,000 acres of land which is managed for water supply. The vast majority of that land is redwood forest, <coughs> in which no herbicide is used for any reason. One parcel owned by the district contains 40 acres of critical habitat six endangered species confirmed on the site, several species of special concern, and a large number of endemic species which occur, which occur only in sandhills habitat. Due to historic human activities, such as mining, development, invasive species introduction, introduction the vast majority of sandhills habitat, which was once widespread in the San Lorenzo <coughs> Valley, has been lost or degraded. There's a total of 57 acres of sand parkland habitat. The classification is for the highest quality sandhills habitat left in the world. The San Lorenzo Valley Water District owns 14 of that 57 acres. 24%, 25%, 24 acres. 24 percent, 25%, 24.7% to be precise. Um, of that 57 acres, okay. In, in 2017, the board adopted a plan to manage invasive species which are threatening to degrade, to further degrade the sand parkland habitat on the site. For the past two years, the district has worked to manage the invasive species and to protect sensitive habitat and biodiversity. The district has conducted cut stump treatment on a total of 16 acres with varying densities of French broom and Portuguese broom, prioritizing highest quality habitat in adjacent areas to prevent further spread of invasive species into sensitive habitat areas. The second priority was to remove brooms that are outliers to prevent new dense patches of broom from taking hold and spreading around the property. A total of 16 ounces, um, two cups of non-Monsanto brand glyphosate, has um, approximately one ounce per <laughs> acre, has been used, and the cost for the labor and materials was, for both years, $13,310. Monitoring efforts following the treatment have shown that the cut stub treatments have been 100% effective with no resprouting from the treated stumps. Removal of the broom has resulted in 
the return of rare and endangered flora, such as Ben Lomond spine flower, to areas where dense broom patches were removed. Broom, brooms have a seed bank that can last up to 50 years. Ongoing maintenance of the, will be critical for those areas treated, or they will germinate and begin dropping seed within three years. The city of Santa Cruz has hired a, a consultant to prepare an integrated pest management plan. The city is still in the scoping phase, and this when this memo was prepared. The budget to prepare the document was $50,000, and the date com for completion has not yet been set. Um, the initial scope includes the necessary extensive community engagement to ensure an acceptable integrated pest management policy is adopted. If I may say something. I think the people, the residents of the San Lorenzo Valley Water District have spoken. They do not want glyphosate used. And I know in, I think it was May of 17, you're going to have a blue ribbon panel. You were going to see about getting a poll uh, permit, various things, N none of that's been done. Um, I <coughs> think that we don't really know the true effects of glyphosate and what does it do? What does it do? I mean, if you go to the Zioni Fire Station and stand there, at night in the summertime, you hear all these frogs and crickets and all this, there's butterflies. And what does this do to those species? Do we know? Do we know if this bothers the June beetle? Has anybody captured some June beetle since this was done and see if there's any poison in their system? I, I mean, what do we know? It reminds me of DDT, and people said, oh, no way. We can't stop using DDT because the bugs are going to destroy our crops. Well, that didn't happen. Lois, can I so, answer your questions? Uh, you have, <coughs> I know exactly what you think. And you're not going to change I, my I, mind. I'm not trying to change your mind, but I just want to let you know that we know a lot about it. Glyphosate is probably the most well-studied chemical ever in the history of chemicals. <laughs> and so we know a lot about it. And, and, it, and it most likely is carcinogenic. And that's what the studies are showing. And those carcinogenic effects are directly related to exposure, time of exposure, and dura duration of exposure. So people who are working with glyphosate on a regular basis the one case where the man won the case, the court case, um, because he had cancer due to exposure to glyphosate, was a um, groundskeeper for a school and was using it without personal protective equipment on a regular basis and was was repetitively exposed to the chemical. So that is, that is where the risk comes in. There's a risk for every kind of thing, and I'm not trying to change your mind, but just to answer your question, we do know a lot about it. And, and the research is in and... And a human and being is, is a lot bigger than a frog and a June beetle. So how much, you don't really know how much it affects the little critters. <laughs> right, but what I, I would, and my only response to that, and I'm still, I'm not trying to change anyone's mind, but I would say that when you have a dense, patch of invasive species that are crowding out the habitat for, for, for sensitive habitat with a lot of endangered species that are adapted for um, nutrient, you know, a, a sandhills sand habitat. Hills habitat, and you have a, 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 a big dense patch of brooms come in there, the impacts are significant. And if you use, if you, and the studies have shown that if you're using the glyphosate in a very careful way that you're only getting it on the broom, the other species will come back. And so 
and that has been demonstrated at the Mount Hermon quarry um, through Jody McGraw's work, and I've talked to her personally about that, and she's done hundreds of acres of restoration in Sandhills habitat, and it has resulted in the recovery of many of the endangered species on that land. Right, and I've seen <clears throat> other things that are totally different. So, I, I mean, I don't want this to become a huge <coughs> issue tonight. I think that we need to... I, I, I think we need to stop using it. I think we need to ban it. And we can start. My husband hated the broom. He was insane about it. He was a quiet guy, but if he got going on a broom, he was insane. There's no broom on my property because he's yanking it out every time he had it. A chance, and we haven't even applied for a pole permit. But you don't live in Santos. No, I know that, but I live amongst a beautiful redwood trees. Right, but that's Fat, you know, I'm not going to argue with. I really wouldn't like to debate this tonight. I mean, if you do want to debate, I, I want to. You you've already to make had. A motion that we, that we ban it. it. Well, Period. you can say your thing. Is that what you want to say? Yeah. Well, no, okay. Motion to ban it. No, it lets we gotta let the public talk. And you can talk, Bob. So I, I wanted to make sure I understood what you were writing in in your memo, which I do appreciate you putting that together. Um, do we know when we acquired these uh, fourteen acres? It was part of the Olympia watershed. watershed in Seventy seven. Seventy seven. Yeah. Acquired from the Ferrari company. It was slated for development, and the water district recognized it as an important groundwater um, supply location and important for groundwater recharge. So at that time, the, the district purchased the property from the Ferrari. Are the 57 acres, is it, when you say total 57 acres, is that the only um, high, high quality sandhills habitat left because I heard you say that Jody had worked on hundreds of sandhills. Right, so sandhills is really a varying, um, there's varying qualities of sandhill habitat. So you can have sand where you're not getting a lot of the endangered species. In the areas where you're getting a lot of the endangered species that are, and it's a really nice habitat, that's called the sand parkland habitat. There's only 57 acres of that. Left. Okay. And are those contiguous? They're not. So our 14 acres are sort of separate from all the other 40. Well, the 14 acres, acres is contiguous to some of it, but there are other parts that are uh, that are not contiguous. Uh, I understand. Of the acres that are contiguous, are the other who are the other property owners? Are they, uh, the land trust is right next door, and the Meyer easement is right there. Those are also uh, San Parkland. Are all the other owners um, managing their broom in the same fashion? Yes. And have the same commitment to get rid of it? Yes. Obviously, we don't want, you know, broom doesn't care about, you know, That's boundaries, it. right? Yeah. I, mean, it, I grew up where there was a lot of broom, and I tell you, it was one of my jobs when I was a kid to pull it. Um, Okay, and then on the calculation of one ounce per acre, was that is that just the average you're talking about, or was that a measured amount that you applied on a per acre basis? That's on average, and it was the eight acres was not like a uniform blanket of broom. There would be big patches here, and then a couple of outliers, and so overall we were treating about eight acres per year, and um, and we used um, eight ounces each right. year. And so, basically, in some areas, it'd be more of a concentrate than others. Yes. Um, okay, and in terms of the way this was worded, with the clause on there, until an integrated pest management policy can be adopted, I mean, I can see that that would lead one to say, well, maybe glyphosate will become part of the integrated pest management policy that's adopted. Um, I'm sure that... Santa Cruz will be looking at that as part of their uh, as part of their study. Um, right. Not mention that the city of Santa Cruz has banned it, glyphosate until their integrated pest management plan. So you're basically saying let's do the same thing and and perhaps reconsider it in the future. Is that what you'd like to well, have done? Have a public process where people can provide input and we can have 
you know, the science and, a, and the public um, process where we can create a pest management plan that works for us, but that would, this in your, community. But that would, in your view, include glyphosate. I'm not saying that. I'm saying it would be up to the community to have that public debate. Okay. And, they, and it would be up to this board and the community at that time to decide. I mean, we did have a bit of a debate on that in the last uh, few well, months of the year. Well, we um, didn't get through the, the Blue Ribbon Committee. I don't think they have filed a report back to the board. You know, that Blue Ribbon Committee at this point is... And so uh, just some other things that we didn't complete. The, the Blue Ribbon Committee is a year and a half into... What was it? It was May. April or May of 2017. 17. So we're going on to almost two years. I agree. You know, I mean, that, that doesn't seem to be a commitment um, to doing more with it than um, perhaps just sort of leaving it out there. I, I, I can go either way. Well, either striking the clause until an integrated pest management policy can be adopted or not. Because at the end of the day, if the integrated pest management policy comes back with uh, glyphosate as part of that, I, I'd simply move to, to strike it. Um, I mean, I suppose it would be interesting to see what you come back with in support of that, um, the use of glyphosate, but it's, you know, we kind of made our positions clear on that over the last few months. Um, so if you, well, did direct, you, did direct, you, did you, well, no, Director, you Sw Director Swan made a motion. Um, to adopt as is without No, to, 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 to ban glyphosate. So uh, basically we would. Basically cross off the until okay. and then put, um, Banned forever. Correct. Yeah, and, just a motion um, of the board. We don't have a resolution. We have a motion of the board. So that may have been the motion. Uh, and and uh, uh, clarification. The words forever are essentially irrelevant. Yeah, the board can't the do something yeah. that prevents another. Right. Yeah, we can. Right. Yeah. A new but, board can come back and say. We can just say ban. Just an, an, another, another little point about this. As, part, as they move ahead with the pest, uh, with the integrated pest management, I think at the same time, board and the, uh, the district has to look at this piece of property. You know, I've got some, quite a bit of history where one board has come in and, and spent twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 on a base of species eradication, and then all of a sudden nothing happens for two or three years, then it comes back double. We've been doing this back and forth for quite a while to where we'd get a start on it, and then you know, we'd let it go for a couple of years, and the work we done was lost, and, and the money we spent. We need to, if we don't, we need to develop a plan to eradicate the invasive species on this watershed and continue with it. And how we do that, pulling it, glyphosate, whatever, but we need, and we do have invasive species that we have to protect. We own this property, we extract a large amount of water off of it, we have to be good stewards of this property. So it has to go, at the same time we're looking at integrated pest management, we need to develop program to manage this parcel. I'm sorry, I forgot to ask one question. Is these 14 acres contain our wells? It's on the parcel of our wells. I, I, but our wells are not asking you, right, right in the middle of that. No. No. So one of the other things that we might want to think about as well is whether or not it is, it is something that other organizations who are more tactically and financially um, uh, focused on preservation like this might want to, uh, I'm mostly concerned about producing water and making sure that we have the watersheds to be able to do that. Um, our, our business isn't um, as, as it is with a land trust or other people who are more set up to strategically do that kind of preservation. And that might be another part of the conversation that we have. Let's add a sure. question. Is but, part of our, uh, our own land trust thing that we created, is that Part of this acreage, part of the 14 acres is yes. now in the preserve. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Margaret's had her hand up. So, the use of glyphosate seems to me. I look out at the audience and I see most of you probably are of the age where you were probably informed by Rachel Carson's Silent Spring. There's every reason to consider the safety of our own employees, our residents and the landscape that we are stewards of. At the same time, I don't think it's fair for our ratepayers and honest of us to think about and talk about this without the context of how much it costs 
to eradicate the broom on those lands that we are stewards of through physical means. How much does it, how much more would it cost to do this management of this invasive species and work on a long-term eradication, you know, mission eradication for 50 years maybe, if the seed bank lasts 50 years, how much more does it cost? I, I don't see any value, there's no intrinsic value in glyphosate. And I wouldn't advocate for its use unless the board and until the board makes a conscious weighed choice about this is how much it costs to do it otherwise, and this is how much it costs, including its risks, to use glyphosate. And you have those things side by side and you look at it. And there's another piece that I want to point out, is that we've made much ado and had a lot of sturm and drang about the use of glyphosate in this district. We've used 16 ounces in two years. How many gallons are sold by the local hardware stores to people who are not trained, don't use personal protective equipment, and fling this stuff around like used socks or something, you know, just like indiscriminately? How many gallons, how many tankers of this stuff is used by Caltrans? PG&E around their power poles, by the county, by whomever else is responsible for roadside vegetation management or other infrastructure management. If we want to take on this crusade because it's the right thing to do, and we remember our brothers and sisters, the bugs and the trees, and thank you for that, are we prepared to take on the people who are using this not a gallon, not a cup, but a frickin' drum at a time. Otherwise, it's like we're just hitting ourselves in the thumb with a hammer. Oh, let's pick on ourselves and make it harder for ourselves and spend more money to do something that we think is important to do than we needed to spend. I know you guys are really keen on fiscal conservatism and fiscal stewardship. You can't have the conversation about watershed management and invasive species management and the use of glyphosate without bringing that question into the conversation. So I would support a ban on glyphosate, but not out of the context of, let's acknowledge, the long-term stewardship costs. I'm done. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, Chris? You remember my name. Thank you. <laughs> um, I, um, you know, I've heard a lot of good stuff that you said, and, and you know, personally, I pull my broom at my house every year uh, because my neighbor doesn't, and it does receive over the fence line. It just it doesn't. I finally asked him, could I come over to his house and pull the stuff? And he let me. <laughs> um, but but I don't live in the Sand Hill area. And I actually had a conversation about this with Mark Stone. And he said, well, you know, I was the person who pushed for the county to ban it and got it banned in the county when, when I was a supervisor. And I said, yes, I do know that. And, uh, and I said, but if you physically remove the plants from the Sand Hill um, environment, uh, like I do at home, there are protected species there that you're going to be disturbing their habitat by by yanking these things and by pulling them. And he said, oh, in that case, if you do that, that would be what's called a taking under the environmental protection or whatever, and some environmental law that I don't know the name of, but it would be a violation that the district could be sued for, was the upshot of what he was telling me. Because you would actually be violating a protected habitat by yanking the roots out and disturbing that under underground area where some of these protected species live and nest and whatever else. So um, that, other than what Mark told me, I'm completely ignorant about that, but it was something that he raised that needs to go into the calculation. It, as far as that's why you need a pull permit. 
Okay, but it, apparently, according to him, that would still be illegal, so it wouldn't be issued if you got a full, the full permit wouldn't be issued. If it well, if it was issued, it couldn't be. But then, so my question would be then, if it couldn't be pulled because of what Mark was saying, um, then we would need another option. And so it seems like if we <coughs> develop the other option before we did the ban, and I completely understand the desire for the ban, I don't like this stuff either, um, and don't use it, um, but if we didn't develop an alternative to it before we banned it, then we'd be in the position of having the sand hills look like my neighbor's yard just covered with the stuff. Um, and like um, like Rick said, we've been there before, you know, where we've got it all under control and then all of a sudden it's back because uh, we didn't have a strategy to control it. Chris Moran? Rick, 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 Rick Moran, I, I'm sorry, Rick yeah. Moran. Thank you. I'm sorry. You never come over. Right. I don't mind being called Chris. All right. Um, in 2015, the World Health Organization, uh, a agency, the International Agency for Cancer Research, categorized glyphosate as a probable carcinogen to human beings. 2015. That started my learning about more about this uh, issue. All right. After that, the California Office of en Environmental Health Hazard Assessment, otherwise known as Prop 65, said it was a probable human carcinogen. Okay. California Supreme Court reiterated that. Uh, former Operations Director Rick Rogers stopped using glyphosate in 2017 because he had understood the same kind of information that's going out. A jury has ruled in Benicia that uh, Monsanto is held liable for causing the non-Hodgkin's lymphoma cancer to this person, okay? The um, public stock of Monsanto's public or uh, parent company, Bayer, since that ruling has lost 40% of its stock value, the largest stock value drop in the history of the German stock market, okay? The people have spoken, agencies have spoken, all right? Uh, there is a growing number of districts, water districts, California cities, parks departments, school districts, and various other public agencies that manage vegetation and are banning this product. The tide has turned on glyphosate. You are either going to go with the tide or you are going to resist this and it's going to cost you a lot of money and put people at risk. All right. I support having a non-conditional ban on glyphosate, not until City of Santa Cruz does its study. They can do their study. These people, these agencies have made their study and have voted. All right. The people of, San, of the San Lorenzo Valley Water District had three candidates that spoke clearly about this, and they voted overwhelming for them. The people of, Santa Cruz, of San Lorenzo Valley have heard this, have discussed it, and they are ready for it to be banned now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I can't, oh, Jenny. I've been characterized as being pro glyphosate and will not be able to continue to serve on the environmental committee somewhat due to that, this perception by the new board. But I would like to make my position very clear. I am not pro glyphosate. If there were time, I would love to describe how very erroneous that perception is, but it is not as important as describing what I'm really in favor of, which is the sand hills and protecting our local biodiversity. Getting lost in this controversy is the 14 acres of sand hills parkland habitat that is 25% of all that remain in the world. San Lorenzo Valley Water District owns 25% of the most unique and threatened habitat, of one of the most unique and threatened habitat types in the world. Only 57 acres total, and the only place it all exists is right here in Santa Cruz. It is hard to overstate how unique and wonderful our Santa Cruz mountains are. Biologically, we are a biodiversity hotspot within a hotspot. Just yesterday, I received the new issue of Flora with the annual uh, treasure hunt review, and what do I find featured? 
our sandhills and two of our many sandhills endangered species. Why do we care about preserving this biodiversity? Many people think furry and cute species, or maybe the species that we eat are the only ones we should really consider saving, but this is wrong. There are many arguments for preserving biodiversity, but I will just mention a few. Although they don't ever gain much traction anywhere, we should all consider the moral and philosophical aspect of humanity causing the planet's sixth mass extinction event. Who are we as a species, and what does that <coughs> say about us? What does it say about us here in Santa Cruz if we willfully perpetuate this global pattern of biological annihilation? There are also practical arguments. Famously, Aldo Leopold's first law of intelligent tinkering, keep all the pieces. I also prefer to say, let's not pop the rivets on our little spaceship. The Sand Hills is our own canary in a coal mine. Our biological infrastructure is just as important as any of our other infrastructure. Now imagine engineering being told that they could no longer use pollution causing mechanical excavation equipment and they would have to use shovels to dig out and replace a big water main. This, and then suggesting that they could use volunteers to do the extra work and reduce the additional expense. This is what we are talking about doing for the next 50 years in the Sand Hills. Even if we could get this large and ongoing volunteer commitment and the expensive take permits for impacting the June beetle larvae, there are also <coughs> cryptobiotic soils in the sand hills which are hugely susceptible to disturbance. A single footprint can destroy them and they can take more than 20 years to recover. Can I finish? Yes. Development and quarrying has already taken a severe toll on sand hills and parkland sand hills and out of what little is left there are many threats. I am opposed to this ban because it is not being presented with a feasible science-based alternative for ensuring the protection of the sand hills against invasive species. The few alternatives that I've heard about aren't even based in reality. I have my own selfish personal reasons for wanting to preserve biodiversity. Experiencing and learning about the Earth's organisms and ecosystem fills me with wonder. I love it and it brings me so much joy. I also mourn all that's been lost already and with each passing day. And I resent generations who came before me and didn't have the good sense or the character to intervene when they had the chance. Thank you. Uh, you want to speak? I, what's your name? My name, I'm Lee Summers from Boulder Creek. Okay. And I have been pulling broom for uh, 15, 20 years out of Quail Hollow Ranch. Um, and there's been a number of different strategies used. Mostly it's just been physically pulling. It's not in um, sand hills habitat. It's in a variety of other habitats. But um, there's been, we've been pulling um, using, I, I think, uh, I want to say somewhere around 6,000 hours of volunteer over time over, over that period of time over the past 18 years, or 17 years. And um, there was, uh, you know, there, there's been some other strategies. We did use some flaming strategies. Um, there's been with other species besides um, the broom. There's been tarping. Um, but for a handful of times, when we had a big giant plant, there's no, nothing that can wrap. You know, don't have any tools that can pull it out of the ground. We cut it and use a little kind of little needle nose application to get that one plant. So sometimes you just got to, I, mean, I, I, I'm, I don't like using it. I don't use any, any kind of chemical on my own property. Um, but sometimes there's this one little isolated place that you got to pull out that one little tool. And to be able to look very carefully and, and, you know, and not just throw out one tool because you don't like it right now, but be able to have all those options available. Um, it, it's, the sand hills are worth it. I, you know, I, I applaud the last, you know, I love your description. Um, it's something that we really need to take a look at, what's happening to um, this really unique habitat. And um, if you'll use all the tools in our toolbox, is something that uh, I, you know, I look forward to seeing what plan comes out. And um, I look to see all the tools available. So, thank you. Anybody else? Yes. My name is Suzanne Shetler. I live in Ben Lomond. And um, the outstanding example of, of, a, of a form of cancer uh, developing that appeared to be directly related to glyphosate 
was in the instance of a person who was being terribly careless about how he used it. Uh, I don't know whether he had any supervision or not, but it, it was total carelessness. Repeated, application, uh, repeated applications and not wearing the personal protective equipment. Um, but let's talk about the effect in the water, since this is a well field that we're talking about. Has anybody tested the water from yes. the well yes. field and found glyphosate in it? Tested. And the soil? It breaks down over time. The soil has really? been How fast will it break down? Low, low, low I don't have it. Mm -hmm. yeah. It varies, with the, it it varies with the soil type. Had, there has been testing of the water. You can direct basin. your questions to the chair and we'll go from there. Has been tested. We've tested the water, but not the soils, to my knowledge. Not with Jen. No. You know. yeah. the, the water has been tested for chimney. Yeah. And it shows nature. Yeah. Well, water always is tested. Yeah, we specifically look for glyphosate. Yeah. yeah, but you're specifically looking for that. Okay. Are you done? Okay. Are, are you that's, done with your that, comment? That, that's all. Okay. That's, I just wanted to ask the question. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Debbie? Yeah, I want to thank Rick Moran for bringing this to our attention as part of the platform on the election, I think. I think it's not a good idea to underestimate how much people have really looked at this and to say that our feelings are not science-based is to reject the idea that there are plenty of studies that show this is harmful. And I agree with Rick, the tide has turned. Many of these studies are older and the new studies are reversing those finds. Significantly, the Sierra Club has done a good study on it which I believe has been rejected by this district, that says dobbing it on is actually much worse than spraying. It concentrates it more into the soil, and it's going to create more harm. The district has about 8,000 hookups, I believe. I don't know what the population is. I think there's about 19,000 voters. So let's say 25, 26,000 people served by SLD. What is the value of the health of all of your customers? The district's primary purpose is to supply us with clean water. If we're applying something that is already controversial and as time goes by finding more and more problems with it, where it's possibly going to be seeping into our water, it might take a few years for it to go down into the aquifer. I heard Rick Rogers say tonight, we extract a lot of water off this property. It is near our main wells. We are affecting everyone in the district when we apply these herbicides. I'm for a total ban tonight. I'd be happy to have a total ban in a month when we do a, a integrated pest management. I'd be happy to ban this every year. We need to send a very clear message. A lot of jurisdictions, as Rick has pointed out, jurisdictions all over the place are banning this now. We are usually on the, the cusp of the curve for knowing, for moving forward and being progressive, and we've really lost on this one. We're behind it now. We need to catch up and we need to ban it. And I encourage the board to tonight, please ban it completely. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Virgil? Oh, thank you. Virgil uh, Champlin from Brookdale. <clears throat> I'm really confused about characterizing this discussion as being against saving the sandhills because that's exactly what this discussion is about, saving the sandhills. We're disagreeing a bit here with the technique for saving it. Now, my personal um, observation is that glyphosate is evolutionary a dead end. It's not a solution. There are already glyphosate resistant soybeans and corn. Now, what are you going to do when you grow glyphosate resistant broom? I have never seen pull a resistant uh, broom. <laughs> So you've got to make a choice here based on science. Now, I'm agreeing with that. But it just, glyphosate just, you know, all of the other arguments might, might or might not be right. It's just, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a stopgap method. It's always been a stopgap method. Everything that the fertilizer industry has given us has been a stopgap method. So, you know, 
It's evolutionary at that end. Sorry. Okay, thank you. Uh, Tony? Well, and, and I would like to echo what you said. Just because we're, someone is um, opposed to glyphosate doesn't mean that we don't want to protect the, the Sand Hills. But, I, and, you know, Santa Cruz County, we're known for really caring about the environment. And I, one article that I read and said that the World Health Organization, that, what is it, that I, IR? I, I, the one with AR, ARC or IARC, mm -hmm. the one department and organization within World Health that is, that deals with cancer. They said that they did find that it is cancer causing and for all of those, all of those organizations across the country that are uh, responsible for keeping their waters safe, that that they that this they don't have proof that this is going to impact the waters, but their information and their recommendations <coughs> are that you should halt what you're doing and wait and see how if you have to keep safe the, the people that are drinking that water. So that is their recommendation, and you stop using it until all of the tests have been completed about how dangerous it is. And I agree that we there must be there must be some other means if if yanking it if maybe there's something else that we can do we we need to to look into that but we shouldn't be using glyphosate. Chuck. Um, yes, I can't speak nearly as passionately to this issue that as Lee and Jenny did, but I, I really don't want to address the, the use of glyphosate and what I say tonight. <coughs> what I want to address is. What are you going to do instead of this? And there's been significant talk that, um, that money should not be invested in this sort of activity, in protecting these very precious uh, ecosystems. And that's what I'm concerned about, that you're, you're not coming back and saying what you will be willing to do. And I mean, um, I think both uh, Jen and Jenny have talked about the fact that we have 25% of the remaining high quality habitat on this one property. This is um, almost world-class uh, protected okay, special um, ecosystem. And yes, um, one of the, uh, one, you know, I have a copy of the mission statement here, and one of the things in that says that we um, have an obligation to provide our customers and all future generations with safe and high-quality water. But, but another part of that mission statement is to say uh, that we have an obligation to protect the environmental health of the watersheds. So we need to take on both of those uh, imperatives from that mission statement and figure out a way to do both of those things. And I'm concerned that, um, that the, you know, the passionate interest in the environment is not going, um, that the new directors have stated in some of their material during the election, will not translate into taking any action beyond the absolute minimum regulatory requirements. And that's what bothers me. Um, and some of that's going to be expensive because of the change in this, and if that's acceptable to the board, that's fine. But you need to take that on. You need to, um, you need to do what the Groundwater Sustainability Agency is doing. Uh, one of the things that Dave Seppo has talked about tonight <coughs> is that agencies can do more than the bare minimum. Uh, you know, there's a certain level of January 2015 that you need to uh, address. You can choose to do more than that. I think this board should should respect the desires of a significant part of our community and say that we're going to do more than the bare minimum. Um, so I'm asking you to come back sometime in the near future, maybe mention something about it tonight, uh, about how are you going to develop a good plan to proceed with this without this tool, if you're going to have, not have this tool in place. And you know, you, you gave a try at a workshop meeting, you can, you've got lots of those lined up for a possibility. Bring this for discussion of what to do to a workshop. The environmental committee is a good place to discuss this also. You don't have to take recommendations from the committee, you can have that as a venue that the public can come to and talk about it. You can talk and list, ask staff to develop alternatives. But don't assume that people want you to do nothing on this. I believe most of the people here want you to take up your responsibilities as stewards of one of the most precious pieces of property in our valley. Thank you. Anybody else? Lou? I would like to request, for the sake of transparency, that the district post all the information it has on the testing of glyphosate in those 14 acres, including the test methods, 
the detection limits, and the MSDS for what you used. Because then we can look at the information, the real facts ourselves, and do a scientific based decision without uh, using opinions. Because I, I don't know, I tried to research, I could not find the half life for glyphosate, I could not find the LD50 for glyphosate. Well, you can't tell how dangerous it is without those numbers. And in particular, I would like to know what the, what the actual results were and where the testing was done and how it was done. What was the end? What was the analysis done afterwards? All that posted so we can take a look at it and make our own decisions. Could you tell me what those acronyms stand for? I LD50 I is a lethal dose for 50% of the organism that you're, that you're attacking that with. Thank you. Greater than 50% is exposed it's, to it. Um, Technically, there's three any, organiza or any organism exposed to it. And they often use minnows as the, the, the well, test basis. Well, in the MSDS, it defines what, the, what that uh, organism is that, that, that you're using LD50. Typically, MSDS. it's mice. MSDS, what is that? Ma uh, material safety data sheet. Thank you. Appreciate that. All Those that information has to be in there by law. Those are available um, online. I couldn't find it. We have to talk about I, it. I mean, if you buy it, you get it. If you don't buy it, you don't get it, is what I found. But okay. Okay. Anyway, I, I don't see why we, we couldn't have that posted on our website so we can all take a look at the data for ourselves okay. and make our own decisions. Okay, back. So, back. Chris White, Ben Lumen, I would just, I'm just asking for cost. Long-term cost. You already don't have money. <laughs> Sorry, you don't. Right. So, in part of this process, how are you going to fund taking care of this? In a long-term solution, not one year, not one year. They used Roundup a lot on their property and had that very cancer. And I certainly wouldn't have called them foolish or <coughs> uninformed or sloppy. People just don't know what this stuff can do. And it'd be nice if... Uh, if people could be taught. And I think, I, I mean, lately I've been seeing a lot of ads have, do you have cancer? Have you used, um, and they, they're they saying Roundup, they're not saying glyphosate. Uh, I've seen that. So I don't see anything, I, we need to have budgets and we need to decide how we're going to take care of the broom. It needs to be taken care of. No argument for me. But I frankly would like to see a ban tonight. And, and um, it, we will have to do an integrated pest management um, study. But I would probably go for saying, you know, there's different areas in that and probably we would, even if we don't ban it tonight, would ban it again. I just as soon not necessarily have to have this conversation again, but we probably will. Um, but I, I would like to see it banned tonight. No. I'm probably one of the only people in this room that's actually bid on properties and bid over two acres of property and cleared law. And I can, it's a testament to the cost of removal. It's a negligible difference between pulling this, um, the broom. And as far as large broom, I've pulled very large broom in my neighborhood, like Fox, like that. And you should have called me, I would have came over and pulled it up. But anyway, I, I was, you know, if anyway, I was really concerned is that it's probably over a year ago that I, I, I know for a fact there's an alternative method to doing that without damaging. And my plan was to do only small areas of manual pulling with the pull permit with the careful biological monitor, uh, you know, watching the progress. And, and studying and <coughs> how the effect of all the species and I and there there also may be um, something else but the voters really have spoken so I, you know I, I you know I, I really think that we should director Swan made a motion to ban it entirely and I second it and I, I believe it I'm sorry I didn't hear that 
Oh. Yeah, he did. He he just kind of mumbled. Yeah. Oh, did not hear. Okay, uh, Bob, but we mm -hmm. we yeah, Bob. Yeah, I think um, I think of what everybody's talking about in terms of the uh, fiscal impacts of what our plan is going to be. It, it, absolutely right on, and that is something that between staff and ourselves, and hopefully people in the audience, will be able to develop. And I think Bill's made some good points over the year. I, I heard two points that I think I wanted to respond to that, that Margaret talked about. And one is, are we going to take on the world on this? Uh, or that we should be prepared to do that as part of this ban? I, I, I will respectfully disagree. Um, I liken this to something very similar to what California is doing in the area of becoming carbon neutral or perhaps you know lower carbon. Folks, India and China are pumping more carbon into the atmosphere by building the amount of power plants that they're building and they're coal-fired than we're possibly going to offset through anything California itself is going to do. But that doesn't make the effort any less um, uh, valuable or any less noble or any less important. And so, no, I, I, I'm not out there basically saying we're going to go fight everybody, but what I am saying is that the example the district sets by doing this is going to be another brick in the wall that's being built on this. And I'm happy and proud, uh, hopefully it will be a positive vote, I'd be happy and proud to be part of that. Uh, I don't think it is necessarily um, uh, something that we should not do just because no one else is doing it. On the second point about funding, I, I do hear that this is a valuable piece of property. Um, how long have we, how long has this been under protection? Um, the June, when, when did, what year did that sort of happen? Mm -hmm. It was in the 90s. Yeah. And, and so one of the things that, mm -hmm. one of the things that I talk about, or I will be talking about a lot in environmental, is sort of the reverse of the externality costs that are done for pollution, and that is the internal costs that are associated with uh, an organization, uh, agent, regulatory agency, coming in and saying, okay, your property now needs to do this, and by the way, we're not going to fund it. If this is such critical property and such valuable property, which I believe that it is, the question is, why should 8,000 subscribers be the sole financial supporters of the rehabilitation of and maintenance of this property? It seems to me that the state of California, the county of Santa Cruz, other funding agencies should be encouraged to preserve something that is so valuable <coughs> to the world because there's only 57 acres left. And by the way, this just isn't our 14 acres. I think that we ought to be looking at the entire 57 acres for that kind of thing. Whether that happens immediately or not is beside the point. The case needs to be made that these kinds of externalities need to somehow be funded by the organizations that are forcing this externality to happen. Um, because otherwise, 8,000 people here are going to be solely financial, financially responsible <coughs> for dealing with this. And so that's something that I'll, whether or not it happens, I don't know, but that's something that I would definitely encourage our supervisor, our assembly member, our congressperson, senators, what have you, to the ones that were congratulating me for winning um, and an issue to basically say, this is so important that we're going to find funding for it to basically preserve it for eternity through the use of more than just 8,000 subscribers and their money. Okay. So I, <coughs> I would like to offer an addition or an amendment to the motion for the ban. If my board colleagues would consider adding the words, or something like this, to not only ban, but simultaneously then Commit to um, appropriately funding and and implementing a long-term plan <coughs> for complete eradication of the invasive species on the watershed properties. You know, I think that that is a very good thing to talk about. 
but not as part of this motion. Yeah. But I would agree. Well, Gina, are we precluded from adding that to the no, that agenda could, item? It could be added. Or just a question. That could be added. It's within the scope of the agenda item discussion. But I, but I do think that this is a topic. Look, <coughs> this district had almost two years to develop the alternatives through the Blue Ribbon Commission that was supposed to have delivered its report in, I would hope, a timely fashion, failed to do so. Um, this board is not going to shirk its duties on coming up with what that alternative is, I believe, from what I've heard tonight. Um, but this motion is, in my opinion, about the ban and the ban. And that's what I think we need to focus on. Do you want your, well, is there any second to add her, her? Oh, uh, well, I think what Bob said, I mean, I, I mean, I'm, I, that sounds great, and I, I think we, we are going to be committed, but I, would, I think what Bob made sense, I think, let's just, we just, we just have, we're just talking about glyphosate here, yeah. and we will come, I mean, I think we're definitely going to be committed to that, but I, you know, I think, come back to what I saying. totally agree with what he said. But um, I just think, why don't we just go with um, Director Swan motion as it stands and vote okay. on it. Okay. Do you want to repeat your motion? So if, if Holly did... It's recorded. Oh, it's recorded. I, I hope I'll be able to hear it. <coughs> okay. Well, maybe it ought to be repeated because maybe other people didn't hear it. That we, uh, move, that we move forward with the ban on glyphosate and strike the language that refers to having to complete the uh, test management plan. All right. Uh, could you uh, call the question, Holly? Uh, I beg your pardon? Or ask for the vote. Oh, okay. I just tend to say call the question. That's just... <laughs> okay. Uh, Director Foles? Yes. Director Smallman? I like saying aye, so I said aye. <laughs> Director Swan? Yes. President Henry? Yes. Director Bruce? Because I would be in favor of a longer and more transparent process, because I'm in favor of the use of glyphosate, I would like this to be considered as part of the integrated pest management plan, so I'm voting no. Okay. All right. Um, it's Boy, we've been at this for a while. So, hmm? yes, agenda item of I, I mean, I had some ice cream. It was easy. Okay, so consent agenda. Next item. I would move approval of the consent agenda. Any questions on the minutes? No? Okay. All righty. Mm -hmm. We it's consent agenda. We are all in favor. Everybody's in favor. Okay. Uh, we don't have to vote on the consent. It's not all right. Right. Okay. Uh, district reports, uh, how fast can uh, <laughs> that be done? Well, you have uh, the uh, administration, finance, environmental operations, and legal reports in front of you. Uh, management staff is here to answer any questions you may have, um, or if any of the management team would like to point out any highlights to the board. We'll so. Have you got a question? I do, I do. I have a burning question about LAFCO and the Bear Creek wastewater. And what was their interest? And what and all of a sudden piqued LAFCO's interest? It's a good question. Um, I got a, a notice from the executive director of LAFCO, Pat McCormick, that they were going to commission a study uh, for the Bear Creek Estates wastewater and some other facilities throughout the county to see the best fit for operation maintenance, whether it's the water district, whether it's the county, whether it's private ownership. Uh, I went to their meeting 
uh, that they held in, their, in the uh, selection of a consultant to do such. They're supposed to interview the different agencies. What does that mean? Uh, they will go after the commission and report. And I'm like, when I asked, well, what does that exactly mean? If they came back and said, maybe the county is the best place uh, for it, can operate it most efficiently. Um, not much, because there's other fire districts that they've recommended consolidation 15, 18 years ago that are, are still the same. But it would be another step in the process, and it's another question that's answered by the Bear Creek. You know, if the folks to, 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 you know, where is it best fit? And the county, some, you know, the John Richter of the county is believes it should be under the county. Public works who would do the operations of it really don't want to take it, okay. take the responsibility over. But it'd be another, another step in the process uh, to work with those people out there. And, and if it came and back, if well. it comes back and says SLB <laughs> staff are doing a, a good job and are operating the system most economically, in some ways it would be a feather in our cap to show the people that uh, yeah. that a independent agency looked at it and looked at our operations. Which you know, I don't believe they're going to find anything that says that they're not operating properly. But I also think that maybe the county is where they're going to find it more fit because they operate other small districts up in this area. They have the equipment. They have more expertise, <coughs> more expertise than the district does. So it should be the study should be out. I think around Juneish, somewhere around there uh, after Pat McCormick retires. So uh, more to follow. Okay. You know, interesting. This has come up before. Yeah. And maybe things have changed, but the county's always said no way. No way. We don't want anything to do with that. So I'll be surprised if they well, do anything other than saying, yes, SLV's doing a good job, well, let them do it. Well, that goes an independent agency and it's an independent consultant. And we have a new public works director yeah. uh, who was always against it before. And so, and Supervisor McPherson has supported it in the past, uh, possibly the county to take it over. Um, but it's kind of too early to tell. Yeah, I know, but, but I, I just yeah. know what the history is. Well, yeah, Bob? Pat McCormick is one of my favorite people down at the county. I've known him for a long time. I'm really sorry to see him retired, but well deserved. Um, but, that, but that does bring up, at, at some point, I'd like to hear how we can get the uh, engineering study done for Bear Creek Estates in an expedited fashion. Um, and so it, uh, I'm hopeful that will come up on the on agenda soon. Uh, the other question I had, and I, I think this is more perhaps of getting ready for the next workshop, and this is for, uh, for Jen. I'm still, um, I think, a little fuzzy about trying to get my hands on precisely where we are in certain things that we're going to report. And so I'm hopeful that when we get to the uh, workshop that's coming up, we'll really be able to dig into these and understand which of these are sort of work in progress long term, work in progress short term, accomplishments, actions, what I'm going to do next month, what, next quarter, et cetera. Because right now I'm having a, a hard time kind of getting my hands around where that's coming. So I believe that workshop's coming up soon. Right? February 7th. February 7th. Perfect. Um, could you give me a call so we could just so I can make sure that I'm addressing all of your concerns? Could you give me a call at the office? Sure, that's, that's, if that's, that's okay. okay. Just so I can sure. um, make sure I I want to make sure I yeah, answer yeah. all your questions. Okay. <coughs> you know? Oh, just a couple of things about Bear Creek Estates. I, I mean, I, during the time I did speak to the new public works director Matt Machado. Um, he didn't like my plan. He didn't think we could build it. But I disagree. You know, I disagree with. I don't know why I disagree with him. But the environmental health, you know, there's two different departments. The environmental health department were interested, well, not in the, but they were interested in helping, obviously, because they were in mm -hmm. it. But they're also talking about um, downtown Boulder Creek. Mm -hmm. So, if, you know, during, you know, eventually, maybe if there's both Boulder Creek and the Bear Creek, you know, it might make it more attractive and make it more sense that the county would take it over, just to t take it over, but you're right, no way that they, they, they didn't want to take over Bear Creek Estates at all because it was just, what, 56 houses and they said, well, and they, yeah. Not to get yeah. too too deep into this kind of yeah. and I subject, but maybe once we get the RFP response back and get some costs and, and we do some work out there, 
and not such a substandard system that may be more palatable to the county and, and look at it. Yeah, that, 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 was, <coughs> that was part of our discussion. Hey, if, you know, if we, if we get this thing all fixed up, yeah. nice, up to date, stuff like that, then will you take, you it's know, it's, it's open to discussion. So, yeah. Yeah. so has James got something to say? I am not. <laughs> you, you're, are you going to sleep? Yes. I don't blame you. Okay. How, how about Stephanie? Um, my main news was on the draft approval of the letter of conditions from FEMA or from USDA for us getting locked in at the 4% rate. Yeah. So that was okay. definitely good because if it hadn't before this government shut down, we would have already been at a 4.25. <coughs> okay. Okay. And that was, you say, on the day of the shutdown? Or it was like the day or the day before. It was the day before. I, I, got, I got a story about it. <laughs> a huge uh, rush to get it inside. I'll tell you that is just as good. Yeah, okay. yeah. All right. Um, I got a couple of questions does, about the, the county. Is that appropriate now? Yes, you can ask questions okay. about, uh, about the bills. Okay. <clears throat> I was just curious on this... Uh, one of the uh, payments to Don Alley Stream Monitoring Program. Is this a monthly bill that we paid him, fourteen hundred dollars? It's, are, 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 it's are, project specific, so it's not monthly. It's a it's one a, time. It, it, he does the temperature monitoring, and he was pulling temperature gauges or something like that for uh, our stream. I'll be talking about it at the workshop. Is that for a, a, a quarter's worth of monitoring or a year's worth of monitoring? It was or? a recent activity that he did. Individual so monitoring it effort? A, it was an, a monitor. It was for pulling the... Divide program. For the labor bill. Okay. And then, and then he's also shown his uh, uh, completed final Fall Creek fish pass. Uh, I can't read. The last word didn't ma imagine. It, it was... Uh, Eight hundred and fifty-eight dollars. Don Alley again. Fall Creek Fish, pa fish Passage study. Oh yeah, he he completed. Uh, we contacted with him a while ago to complete a, a, a fish passage study. <coughs> it had been in draft form for a while, and he finally completed it. So he billed us for the the final. And do we, are we the sole provider of funds for him or does he cross charge or do we cross charge other agencies for his efforts yeah, or services? Just for our project. It wasn't, just for that us. was not a collaborative effort. But there are other projects that we are collaborative with for uh, Don Alley. So. And we, we cross charge other agencies then or they get billed? Other agencies actually cross charge us. So we are collaborative on the fish monitoring project for mm -hmm. Don, with Don Alley. And we get billed from the city because the city manages that contract. I see. Okay. And uh, what is the Thatcher Company and uh, Chlorine underscore WTP? That's a three thousand dollars. That's, that's, that's chlorine. It's chlorine, it's chlorine for the water. Oh, okay. Fifty-five gallon drums of chlorine for disinfection. And WTP yeah. is just water treatment. Did you say leak detection? No, uh, chlorine for disinfection. Oh, okay. Yeah, WTP is the treatment, treatment facilities, and we use that in both, from all, our, for all our facilities. And there's a U utility services associates for leak detection services. Is that a right. one time, a monthly, annual? That's, a That's contract 12 that we do every roughly every three to five years for system wide leak detection. Oh. And uh, how much was it for? Twelve grand. That was the second. No, that was the full price. Yeah. We um, need to pay somebody to tell us we have leaks. These are some yeah, surface yeah. leaks that we can't find. I thought I thought I saw a giant list that you had of leaks that went on yeah. forever. I thought well, we knew every leak there's there was. That list, it including the list that we do not see underground that they do find. And okay. Yeah. Last yeah. Time it's around, it's they found very cool. Yeah. System. Yeah. Very some accurate. leaks you don't know about. Only case. You just know the water's you'll get, disappearing. You'll have a full, uh, a full report on that whole project of how many leaks we found, how much water we uh, saved by repairing those leaks, and where they are. You'll you, see that. Uh, you coded on the map. One of those, yeah. one of those leaks was the six million gallon leak in Zayani that was found by them as well. Yeah, yeah those those leaks can turn into blowouts. This was the last time before this last time that we did leak detection. Those are the leaks we found in our system. And so we will be doing that again with the new leaks that they found on this last round. <coughs> that was three years ago. 
Okay. So, so it's you, a great program. Uh, yeah. You know, the, the new leaks get a different color pen, or <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. might be interesting to not, see. Well, you know? as we get once we get our new engineering department up and running a little better too, we will. Okay. One last. All that through GIS. Just one last question, then. and this is uh, it's called Balance Hydrologists Stream Monitoring Program, and that's a total of eighteen thousand dollars. What's the scoop on that? That is a, a recurring bill that you'll see. That's a contract that we have with Balance Hydrologic to do stream flow monitoring throughout the San Lorenzo River and our tributaries and diversions. Recurring at what frequency? Well, we, we renew the contract annually, and we'll be, re we'll be bringing that to you for a new contract re renewal. And um, does, does somebody else share the cost with us? Scotts Valley, Santa Cruz, SoCal, anybody? Well, State fishing game? Nobody <laughs> no. shares the cost with us, but we do get credit for the, the amount that we pay. Um, we're using it as match, matching funds for the $300,000 grant that we got for conjunctive use. So we do get some, like, that's showing that we're paying half of sort of our water supply um, sustainable water su supply strategy. So we're moving forward with that, and I'll talk a lot about that at the workshop. And the, the balance contract we're getting ready to come to the board for review and approval. Right. Comes balance. for review when? For review or an approval. An approval. Okay. Okay. And we're getting ready to come to the board. And, and, and maybe okay. the point that could be made is that doing that work is not exactly discretionary. Right. That was it for me. Thanks, Stephanie. Mm -hmm. oh. <laughs> You talk way too much, Stephanie. Yeah. Um, yeah. So about that shutdown. Do you fix that sometimes? It's time to stop. Yeah, this is very, very quick. On the written communications from Sharon Tapper. Uh, do we have, uh, she wrote something in. Have we responded and what have we yeah. said? I live in Pinewood Estates, the water quality Water quality issue. issues. She spends thousands of dollars a year with us. I don't know. Um, Please tell me my water is safe. Yeah, yeah. No, we did respond to her and, yeah. and talk with her. I do believe that's going to be sure before I tell you. I, I just would like, on these kinds of things, I personally, I'd be discretion to board, but I'd like to make sure that we're closing, that the information we get is closing the loop. On, on those in, in the future, because when I see things like this, I, I kind of go, well, clench a little bit. It's in the past, whenever there was a written communication that was addressed to the board, it was put into the loop. If you don't want to do that, no, 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 I'm saying no. put it in here, just close the loop, right? So what was the action was taken the as a consequence? I, I don't handle that. Well, I we just do, do it just, just real quick, all water quality complaints are uh, responded to staff member that goes out or makes uh, phone contact. I do believe this one here is uh, we had a, our Paso 5A well. Um, we had damage to the pump that did a jetting into the into the, the, the well screen, which uh, created uh, discolored water, some gravel. We had about uh, 15 or so. The water, responses in my report are the yeah, water yeah. quality yeah. complaints. Um, all in the same general area from this, and staff responded immediately. We took that well offline. Uh, I, I do believe that is one of them right here. Yes. So yeah. it's, water, it's, water treatment. There, there was. Yes. Yeah. As, as of right now, it's kind of hard for me to match. Sure. Uh, no, I, I agree. But seeing this one was uh, addressed to board members, this went straight into correspondence. Front office staff, when a water treatment or water quality thing comes in, yeah. they don't stop contacting no. down the food chain of water treatment until they physically get a hold of someone. Yeah. yeah. But I, I, I did see that in your report, didn't I? That where you happen. talked about how the sand was getting yeah. Yeah. through yeah. the screen. The and complaints, yeah. the and then each yeah. one of those water quality complaints is reported uh, in the state health uh, report uh, monthly to the, to the state. Sorry, I just I don't I didn't see the name and I didn't match up the address. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Question. Question. Mm -hmm. uh, quick update, if I may direct a question to Margaret, because I think you spoke to it in uh, December. 
board meeting. Uh, any further news on the symposium at UCSC on climate change in terms of what we're, we're going to do with that information, either in the SLBWD or with the uh, uh, SNCC? I don't have an update on that, but I know that based on this morning's environmental committee meeting, that climate change adaptation issues, including fire hazards and other watershed, potential watershed impacts, are going to be part of Jen's workshop on the 7th. So that information is going to, is, there's a long list of plans, projects, strategic documents, and activities that Jen's responsible for. And that information is going to be woven into the and does that migrate? Three, at least three of those plans. Okay. Does that migrate to SMIGWA? Because it seems like they, they could benefit from a lot of that information just as much as we. I, more you know what? I, I don't know. Um, I would hope so. But as an alternate to the board, I have little, so far, little influence there. I don't know if anyone from Scotts Valley was... In attendance, I don't. I didn't see anybody from Scotts Valley or from the other agencies in, in attendance at that um, at that workshop. So, all we can do is continue to point in that direction. Um, next week is the Santa Clara County Commission on the Environment meeting, and climate change adaptation is on the agenda for that meeting. Um, I have the privilege of serving on that commission, and I and I pound the drum on adaptation issues when I have the opportunity when I'm there. So um, I, I can continue to push that con those concepts and the, the the priority of those issues, you know, where where I have influence. Can I answer? Hmm. Please. Um, climate change adaptation does show up in the guiding principles for the Santa Margarita groundwater. Well, we didn't cover that as one. That wasn't one of the ones you brought up. But I'm, I, if I recall. Um, it, that is on there. <coughs> I believe climate change adaptation and mitigation will be a, a section in the groundwater sustainability plan as well. So, really, that is that we're both going to be addressed. Mm -hmm. And I, I know we talk about climate change as also we're talking about how we're going to fold climate change into um, the workshops that we're doing too, just to address that. Okay. Thank you for keeping that in mind. All right. Um, I believe it is time to adjourn this meeting. Do you have any announcements you want to make on the <coughs> or anything upcoming meetings? Um, what, Were we going to just remind the board? Okay, so on the 23rd, we'll be having a um, meeting of, with a presentation by Dennis Timoney from SDRMA regarding Brown Act and ethics. It's not going to be an ethics training. It's simply going to be um, uh, training. Mostly it's going to, uh, at the request of the president, we are focusing on the Brown Act. And that's what that's going to be. That's going to start at 5.30 at the um, Highlands Park, on <coughs> the 23rd. And then on the 28th uh, is the Laddock. Um, writing, uh, charter writing, and everyone's invited to that. It's going to be a workshop, and that will be hopefully at Zianni Fire Station. We're not confirmed yet on Zianni Fire until their board meets. On the 22nd. So. Yeah. Okay. You can kind of email us those. Yeah. I have Good flyers night. already to go. I'm just waiting for um, uh, approvals and that sort of thing. Yeah. So you're, you're going to send to all the Committee members, and, committee members, and you're going to put it on the website because yes. mm -hmm. people in the community I can guess. come as well. Mm -hmm. It's a four meeting open to the public. Yeah. For a workshop on the week, so. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, are we done now? Get your hammer. Yes. I try not to use the I hammer. Have gavel. Gavel. Okay. Uh, all right. We're going to adjourn this meeting. It's a quarter to ten. Thank you, Lewis.